Thank you for making it here today for our second forum on addiction. Um, today's topic on women in addiction. Um, we have a lot of important guests and speakers, researchers, treatment providers and practitioners who are here to, um, uh, to give us more information for us to devise a plan moving forward. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Senator Ayotte, who's here to speak uh, this morning, as well as Senator Whitehouse. We have Senator Klobuchar and Senator Portman, who will be joining us soon. So again, thank you for coming, and I'll, has, I'll pass it over to Senator Ayotte. Well, thank you, Jessica. I am so glad to be here with all of you this morning. I'm really honored to be here with my colleague, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, a fellow New Englander, and also a fellow Attorney General, and probably what brings us here as an interest in this very, very important issue. And I also want to welcome, I know you're going to hear from my colleague, Senator Portman from Ohio, and Senator Klobuchar from Minnesota. And all of us here are share the same goal, to get women in crisis the help that they need. And we're very fortunate here to have an outstanding lineup of panelists. I want to thank uh, Director Botticelli for his incredibly important work, all of the experts that you're going to hear from today. And most of all, I want to thank all of you who are working every day uh, to address addiction, to help people who suffer from addiction, and really to lead better quality lives. Because this is an issue, as policymakers, as Sheldon and I were just talking about it, it's not Republican, Democrat, Independent. This is an issue that impacts everyone. And this is an issue that doesn't discriminate. So today, we are going to talk about women and addiction, and the particular issues that women face with addiction, because we know that they're different than men, shockingly, and also the factors that lead women to addiction are different, and how they address addiction and how we may help and treat them are different. So I'm so glad that we're having this important forum today, because as I've already said, addiction doesn't discriminate. It doesn't discriminate from how rich you are, how poor you are, where you're a Republican, you're a Democrat, you're a progressive, you're a conservative. It does not discriminate if you're a man or a woman, but it does impact people differently. And that's why we are having this forum today, to really focus on, on the challenges that women face with addiction so that as policymakers, we can hear from all of you the best way to address this public health epidemic that crosses all boundaries in our country. Uh, I've spent uh, a lot of this year focused on a particular issue that has hit my state very, very hard, and that is prescri prescription drug uh, opioid abuse and heroin abuse. In New Hampshire, we have seen a 60% increase in drug deaths from heroin. And we got our stakeholders together in New Hampshire, uh, whether it was law enforcement, treatment providers, public health officials, first responders, the medical examiner, I got them all in one room, and I was really shocked to hear what is happening in our streets. But I know that New Hampshire is not unique, because I know that this is an epidemic that is happening across the nation. And so today you're going to hear from Senators Portman, Klobuchar, myself, but I want you to know that there are many others in the Senate that are focused on this issue. And I, I'm going to be very proud to work with Senator Whitehouse and the others you'll hear from today to really take your ideas of how we can address uh, not only the heroin addiction, but addiction overall, and make sure that women in our country can lead quality lives, but men as well, because addiction hits everyone. And uh, I've also been working on legislation with Senator Joe Donnelly. And so you have another ally there. And I know that you have many other allies in the Senate. And we intend to engage them on this issue with your feedback and what we hear from you today. In fact, the legislation that uh, Joe Donnelly and I have already introduced is really focused on prescription opioid addiction and the connection between that addiction and heroin. Uh, 
addiction because we've seen that connection. And with the, unfortunately, the cheap price of heroin right now, uh, we've seen also over prescribing and, and sometimes physicians don't even know what they should be doing. So our bill would be looking at developing universally recognized best prescribing practices for pain management, would include well-coordinated education and awareness campaign about the dangers of prescription drug and heroin use, and also would include support for prescription drug monitoring programs and additional uh, resources for not only law enforcement but treatment providers. This is uh, legislation that Joe and I introduced is really what we heard from, from uh, our stakeholders on the ground. And I know right now I'm very proud to be working on a larger effort that all of you are going to help us with today that I know Senator, Senator Whitehouse has been an incredible leader on, Senator Klobuchar, Senator Portman. So we're gonna take the feedback that you give us today and you will be seeing us working on a wider legislative effort to address not only women in addiction, which this is what today's important focus will be on, but also the epidemic of addiction across this country and the public health crisis that we are facing that hits everyone. And you know, I, when I was attorney general of our state, I was really struck uh, by going to our women's prison and meeting many of the women that were in prison. And we know that we can trace many of the criminal uh, activities that women get charged with, with addiction. And we also know that often women who unfortunately have, go and serve time in our prisons, even there they don't get the treatment that they need. They don't get that second chance that they need and the, the treatment as they come back in the community to ensure that they can reestablish a healthy lifestyle so that they don't end up back uh, in that cycle and pattern again. And so this is an issue I've been very interested in even since I've been Attorney General and I hope it's something that you'll talk about today because as I look at women who uh, have been part of our criminal justice system, you can see that addiction is a huge driver for so many women that find themselves in that system. And some of them unfortunately find themselves in that system over and over again. And so we can change that and we can also change uh, this horrible, really public health crisis that makes such a hor an impact on so many people's lives and devastates so many people's lives so that people in this country can live a quality life, that they can reach their full potential, that women can reach their full potential in this country. And this is a big part of it, addressing this uh, addiction, making sure that people are treated with dignity and respect and making sure that we eliminate the stigma. St stigma. We know that many, uh, many people don't come forward, uh, many women don't come forward to seek the help and treatment that they need uh, because they're just afraid. They're afraid that someone is going to say something negative, that someone is going to treat them uh, like, like th that there's something really wrong, wrong with them in, in a way that, that they just don't feel comfortable coming forward. And so one thing as leaders I think that we can do is really encourage people that this is something that hits everyone and to eliminate the stigma. Because I've been really struck by the, the, those who are recovering, who have come forward, their tremendous courage in doing so. And uh, I've met women in my state who have had the courage, incredibly accomplished women who have come forward and admitted that they have had an addiction and been an inspiration to others. So hopefully as policymakers, we can also do more to address the stigma that comes with addiction so that we can get people the help that they need. And with that, I am very honored to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, he served as Attorney General for the state of Rhode Island, as I did for New Hampshire. Uh, this is an issue that he focused on when he was Attorney General. He did a tremendous job. And in the United States Senate, he has really taken a leadership role on this issue, not only women in addiction, uh, but addressing the crisis of addiction in this country. And I'm honored to work with him. I'm honored to introduce him today. And with that, I would like to introduce Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Thank you, Kelly. We have a uh, really outstanding bipartisan nucleus 
of senators working on this issue, Senator Ayotte, Senator Klobuchar just arrived, Senator Portman and myself, and as uh, Kelly said, there are others who uh, are interested as well because this is an issue that does touch so many people. Really, it touches everyone directly or indirectly. So welcome to the second in our series of events that are bringing together public health folks, law enforcement folks. Kelly was an attorney general. I was an attorney general. Amy was uh, her district attorney for the biggest county in Minnesota. And uh, also the advocacy and recovery community to pull together so that we can design the best strategies and policies for uh, moving through the crisis that we see. I am incredibly grateful for the work that you do every day and for your commitment to this issue. Um, as Kelly said, the path of recovery is not an easy one, and it is marked with courage. And those of you who help people along it are really doing a wonderful and humane act. And it's particularly important, I think, that this conference focuses on the problem of uh, addiction for women, which does have different manifestations than it does uh, for men. And it's emerging so rapidly. The Center for Disease Control, uh, the vaunted CDC, reports that the rate of fatal overdoses uh, through prescription painkillers and other drugs among women in America quadrupled, quadrupled between 1999 and 2010, surpassing automobile accidents as the leading cause of death of daughters, sisters, mothers. There are statistics out, it takes a while to gather statistics, so these go back to 2010. But here are some that should get our attention. Suicides stemming from the use of prescription painkillers accounted for 34% of all suicides among women. Among men, 8%. 34% among women, though, more than a third. More than 940,000 women, nearly a million women, were seen in emergency departments in 2010 for drug misuse or abuse issues. More than 6,000 women, roughly 18 every day, died from a prescription painkiller overdose. And that was four times more deaths among women than deaths linked to cocaine and heroin combined. More than 200,000 emergency department visits were for misuse or abuse of these drugs among women, about one every three minutes in our country. So today's forum on best practices uh, for dealing with this issue um, is really, I think, vital. And I really want to thank all of the panelists who are joining us today. Rhode Island is a small state. We all bump into each other a lot. So I need to particularly uh, shout out the two Rhode Islanders who will be presenting as panelists. Uh, Trista Froman has come down from Rhode Island. She began using cocaine at age 13. And she graduated to heroin when she became homeless at age 19. After an encounter with the criminal justice system sent her to the Bronx, she was extradited back to Rhode Island for treatment. Trista credits Rhode Island's Project Link with getting her back on track during her first pregnancy and beyond, and she is here to share her inspiring story. Welcome, Trista, and thank you for your courage. Jody Rich is a professor of medicine and epidemiology at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University. And he's an attending physician at the Miriam Hospital in Providence with expertise in infectious diseases and addiction. He has advocated tirelessly in Rhode Island for public health policy changes to improve the health of people with addiction and to increase drug treatment 
to the, for the incarcerated and for the formerly incarcerated. Uh, in my office this morning, he reminded, that the first, reminded me that the first time we met was when I was running for Attorney General, which was some time ago, and he was harassing me about making sure I got behind the clean syringe policies. So he's been at this a long time. Welcome, Dr. Rich, and thank you. Let me also thank uh, ONDCP Director Michael Botticelli. Uh, Michael has brought a lot of passion and commitment to this issue. He has brought a lot of experience to this issue. And he is joining us now for the second time. He's two for two on these uh, Senate addiction forums. And I really appreciate that he takes the trouble in what is obviously a very busy schedule to come over and participate so energetically in these Senate efforts. I think you see the promise of these, and uh, I'm really uh, grateful. Um, let me also, again, just thank everyone here. These bipartisan gatherings really make a difference. Your input really makes a difference. One of the ways in which it has made a difference is that, uh, based on recommendations from our first forum back in April, and based on feedback from more than 50 different public health advocacy, recovery, and law enforcement organizations, Senator Portman and I are working on comprehensive legislation aimed at addressing the opiate epidemic ravaging our communities. We plan to introduce this bill very soon, and uh, it has enough shape now that I can tell you that it will include programs to help states with improvements of their prescription drug monitoring programs, improve physician and public education, improve prevention and treatment initiatives, improve law enforcement and criminal justice efforts and coordination, and uh, enhance and expand overdose reversal programs. I look forward to uh, working with all of you towards passage of this legislation. And for all the talk you hear about partisanship and disarray, there's actually a quiet pulse of work getting done where issues really do affect a lot of people and have not become political footballs. And I am confident that we can keep this one of those issues. So now, I have the great pleasure of introducing Senator Amy Klobuchar. Uh, we came to the Senate together in the same class. Uh, she is the former pros chief prosecutor of Hennepin County uh, in Minnesota. My mom was from Minnesota and my aunt still lives in Minnesota, and she thinks Amy's doing a really terrific job. She gets a little bit vague if I ask her, am I doing a better job than Amy, or is she doing a better job? I think she's with Amy, actually. Uh, Amy has been a tireless supporter of drug courts as an alternative uh, to incarceration for nonviolent drug offenders, and she's advocated for improved prescription drug disposal programs as a tool to help reduce access to uh, abuse prescription drug abuse, and uh, she's also one of the absolutely best public speakers in the Senate. I mean, she can hold audiences spellbound. She's an extraordinary public speaker. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Amy Klobuchar, give her a warm welcome. to do when it's that early in the morning. But I want to thank uh, Sheldon for his incredible leadership. All these people from Rhode Island, I always am giving him, I always give him grief whenever I see something where Rhode Island's in the news where it says, the iceberg that broke off is the size of Rhode Island. I always make sure and send it to him. Um, but of course, there's many great things in your state. I'm sure we have many Minnesotans here. Do you want to raise your hands? Huh? Just pretend. There we are, there we are, yeah. We have so many Minnesotans involved in this issue that we, we don't even know all their names. But uh, we're very excited from our state's perspective that this is becoming so front and center and that we have this kind of bipartisan support. We've always had bipartisan support in it uh, for it from Minnesota. Um, Jim Ramstead, 
uh, who is Patrick Kennedy's uh, mentor, uh, is from our state. I just talked to him yesterday, actually, and uh, he's in great spirits. He's in his 33rd year of sobriety that he celebrates on his birthday, which is coming up. Um, and we really take it to heart in terms of how we run our state's criminal justice system. We have one of the lowest incarceration rates in the country, and we're actually proud of that. Uh, whenever I was running for office, I couldn't debate, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't think I really want to put this on my brochure as a prosecutor. Um, but in fact, we had one of the lowest incarceration rates. A lot of that was because we used treatment extensively, and we used probation, and carrots and sticks, and other ways of looking at things. And it just makes for a better place. Place. Along with that, we have one of the lowest crime rates in the country, uh, highest voter participation rates, and I think it just makes for a better society uh, when you treat people with some dignity, understanding, and not just blowing it off, understanding that there's going to be consequences uh, if they don't finish that treatment. And one of the first successful drug courts in the country was actually out of Hennepin County. I inherited it when I got into my job, which I did for eight years, ran an office of 400 people, and we continued the work of making sure uh, that we treated uh, those addicts differently and that we um, would make sure that they got the help that they need. And now those drug courts are all over our state, including some of our more conservative counties. Have they seen it as a way to save lives and they see it as a way uh, to uh, reduce spending as well. Um, I'm also interested in this issue. I think some of you know this because I grew up the daughter of an alcoholic. My dad uh, drank the whole time I was growing up. Um, I had many, many holidays waiting for him, looking out the window, hoping he'd show up. Um, and many uh, hard experiences, including where we almost got killed in a car accident when he was driving. I took the keys away from him when I was in high school um, and had those experiences like so many kids of alcoholics do. My miracle story is that after three DWIs, uh, he finally, as the laws stiffened up, uh, when he was actually facing jail time, and he's a very famous columnist, incredible writer, incredible adventurer, mountain climber, uh, but with that hanging over his head, that jail time, he went to a good treatment program, he got through treatment, um, and he, as far as I know, you know, anyone that's dealt with this, you know, but hasn't drank now for decades, is happily married for the third time, and is 87 years old. So you see, these, uh, these stories have good endings often. Um, and so that's why I believe so much uh, in, in treatment. Um, this issue of women in addiction is particularly close to my heart. Um, as someone who for eight years saw what happened when women got addicted, not just, of course, the obvious that they're addicted to drugs, but that they are more likely than to become victims of crime, uh, that they're more likely to get in trouble themselves because of their addiction. I can't tell you how many women we had that would get uh, would try to go gambling and steal and do things like that uh, to feed an addiction. They often did crimes like accounting crimes and things like that in white collar jobs. They would do crimes that would not necessarily be violent, uh, but given the way the laws work, would put them away for a long time. And it would all be about feeding their addiction. Uh, we in Minnesota have a lot of focus on women addicts. Hazleton, uh, you know, we're the land of not just 10,000 lakes, but 10,000 treatment centers. Uh, Hazleton, which just merged with Betty Ford, um, has a special program for women since in 1956 uh, and has been uh, doing a lot in that area. Um, we also, um, in our state, have done a lot with violence against women. I was one of the leaders on the passing the reauthorization bill. And I think that we know that women are 15 times more likely uh, to abuse alcohol and nine times more likely to abuse drugs if they are in a relationship that involves domestic violence. And so uh, that piece of it, I think, is very important. Um, the drug courts were continuing as we look at solutions to push for more funding for drug courts as the sentencing bill winds its way um, onto the floor. I think you all know we're looking at reducing drug sentencing, um, which I think is a good idea. I think we'll see some changes um, to the bill as it goes to the floor. Um, and one of the changes I'd like to see is to have more in there on drug courts, uh, because I think if we're going to be reducing these sentences, and as you can see from my story from my state, the longest sentences don't always mean you're going to do something about addiction. But that means we have to also look at the other side of the coin and how we're going to be treating people um, if we're not going to have as long a sentences and how we're going to stop that supply, uh, stop that demand as well as stopping the supply. 
Um, Sheldon raised the issue of prescription drugs, and uh, we all know that has now become this major gateway to heroin, um, as a majority of people who have used um, prescription drugs and become addicted, that people have become addicted to prescription drugs are actually the majority of the people who are now using heroin. And it certainly didn't, um, it wasn't like that years and years ago when you thought of in the 1970s and 60s and people addicted to heroin and junkies on the street corner with needles. Uh, now it's become a lot of people who started with prescription drugs, got addicted to Vicodin, and then move on and decide that they're going to start getting heroin because their supply has been cut off for the prescription drugs. Uh, and that is a long way of saying we need to do more about the prescription take-back programs. They've been incredibly successful. Uh, one at the end of April collected 390 tons of unused drugs in our country. Can you imagine? 390 tons that were just sitting around in people's medicine cabinets. Uh, and that's why Senator Cornyn and I introduced and got past the um, drug take-back bill. We are still working with OMB uh, and with DEA on the rules uh, for that program, uh, it really has to get done because it'll just allow pharmacies and others an easier way of taking back these drugs. It shouldn't just be a once a year or twice a year event at a law enforcement that people don't have on their calendar. It should be an easy way where people know they can bring back take, bring back their drugs so they don't have them sitting away around in their medicine cabinet. Uh, Bill Clinton has recently taken on this issue. I was at Johns Hopkins with Patrick Kennedy and spoke on a panel with him on the addiction to prescription drugs. Uh, and um, I just think that's exciting. I just think there's you are at the cutting edge here in terms of looking at new solutions, uh, not just for women, uh, but overall uh, for the population, that if we can reduce this demand and at the same time um, uh, do something on the supply end by not having things sitting around and by not having over uh, prescriptions, which our bill will work on, uh, that we're going to make a big dent uh, in reducing these addictions and helping women all over the country. So I want to thank you for that and all the great work that you're doing and remind you how important it is. I'll end with this. Um, um, it's about uh, helping people you don't even know. This happened when my daughter was four years old and she was in the church play and she was supposed to be the angel and we were sitting in the pews and she had on this big uh, angel costume with these humongous wings and she's sitting there and uh, she won't go out to practice. And I said, why won't you go out to practice? She goes, because I want to be the donkey. And there were these really hot teenage boys in this donkey costume. And I said, no, no, Timmy and Joey are the, are the donkey. You cannot be the donkey. I want to be Mary. And I go, Mary is 16 years old. You cannot be Mary. And you're only four years old. And you have the best part in the whole thing. You get to go at the end and spread your wings. And I don't know why you don't want to do it. And finally, she looks way to the top of the church, which was this high. And she says, Mom, I don't know how to tell them, but I don't know how to fly. And I said that day to her, I said, you know what, honey, not all angels fly. And by, by, by being here today and by being part of this enormous national effort, you're truly saying that you want to give people the wings to fly, people that you haven't even met, people that never may be able to thank you. But you know that they need someone to help them, and you are being their guardian angels today. So thank you for doing that. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce our. Uh, do you want do you want to introduce Mike? Michael? Okay, good, because I've got a very cool introduction. And I wanted to use Sheldon. Okay, uh, Michael Botticelli, who's the acting director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Uh, he was sworn in as uh, the deputy director of the White House office in November 2012, and he served as the director of the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services in the Massachusetts Department of Health. Uh, while working for the Massachusetts Department of Health, he established a treatment system uh, for adolescents, early intervention and treatment programs, jail diversion programs, reentry services for those leaving state and county correctional facilities, and drug overdose prevention programs. In 2008, he was the first recipient of the annual Ramstead Kennedy. See, Minnesota, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, it's like you can't get away from it, uh, National Award for Outstanding Leadership in Promoting Addiction Recovery. He was born in upstate New York. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Siena College and a Master of Education degree from Lawrence College. Uh, he's also uh, long, in long-term recovery from addiction, celebrating more than 24 years of sobriety. 
I give you Director Botticelli. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really an honor to be here, and I really want to thank uh, um, Senator Klobuchar for that really nice introduction, and also uh, Senator Whitehouse. Um, uh, I actually did live in Rhode Island for a number of years, so there's a number of uh, connections here. I'm privileged to do that. And Senator Ayotte and Portman as well. Uh, this is a particularly uh, important forum, and I can I was talking to some people before, and I can't remember a time in recent uh, history where we've really had a forum and a briefing that focused on the unique needs of substance use disorders in women, so I really want to thank them for their leadership. Um, and I also want to echo their thanks to many uh, people uh, in this room, both our federal partners, uh, researchers, practitioners, policymakers, people in recovery. Um, we, we know what we know about addiction and women and addiction from all of the work that you're doing. And uh, I, I've been, I had the fortune to know many of you for many, many years and really want to thank you for your leadership on this issue. And I think it's a really uh, important uh, forum that we uh, have today in terms of how, how we go forward. Uh, I am very honored to uh, represent the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Our office works with federal, state, and local partners to lay out a plan to reduce drug use and its consequences, while also reforming our national drug control policy. Our recently released uh, strategy relies on an approach that balances public health and public safety. It also reflects the current science and state of addiction that is disease of the brain that can be treated for, and from which people can recover. To start with, I'd like to share a few statistics about gender differences in drug use. In 2012, as in prior years, the rate of current illicit drug use among persons aged 12 and older was higher for males than for females. Boys and girls ages 12 to 17 have similar rates of addiction drug use. However, uh, these rates diverge in young adulthood with 25.4% of young men reporting current drug use compared to 17.3% of young women. As you can see from the uh, closest graph to me, women, however, make up a lower percentage of drug treatment admissions, comprising only 33% of overall treatment. This graph also shows the proportion of females admitted to treatment varies by drug. Rates of treatment admissions are higher in women admitted for prescription drugs than for illicit drugs. Also, rates of treatment admissions for men and women are almost even for opioids, amphetamines, and tranquilizers, but with respect to sedative use, women are actually using more than men. This might be one reason, as Senator Whitehouse talked about, why we are seeing uh, increasing rates of overdoses climbing at a greater rate for women than we do for men. Although more men die from drug overdoses, the percentage increase, as Senator Whitehouse talked about, since 1999 is greater among women. Overdose deaths involving prescription pain relievers increased over fourfold between 1999 and 2010 for women. An alarming statistic has to do with drug use and pregnancy in girls. Almost one in five, or 18.3% of pregnant teens aged 15 to 17 reported using an illicit drug in the past month, compared to fewer than one in 20, or 3.4% of pregnant women aged 26 to 44. Our office supports access to appropriate treatment for everyone with a substance use disorder, but because the consequences faced by women can be quite dire, we must acknowledge and respond to the unique experiences to women if we are to make treatment effective and a desirable option. As I travel around the country, I often hear from women in treatment about their desire to be in programs specifically targeted for women. They say they often feel uncomfortable engaging in treatment settings with men, particularly when addressing histories of sexual trauma. Treatment options should also be available to address the unique ne needs of women, allowing them the freedom and comfort to fully participate in therapy. Researchers have shown us success with approaches tailored to women's needs, and you will hear about some of those uh, national experts giving us more information about that. We also know that many women entering treatment have children, but the fear of losing custody of their children can prevent them from seeking care. For mothers to succeed in treatment and to help them to sustain recovery, we must recognize the importance that women place on being parents and how this factors into their decisions they make about their own health and well-being. Women with substance use disorders and dependent children often face significant challenges and involvement with child protective services and the criminal justice system. In many cases, admitting to any drug use is the grounds for removing the children 
uh, from the mother's custody. In some states, drug use during pregnancy may result in child endangerment charges being brought up against the mother. Federal law requires that states have systems in place through Child Protective Services to investigate where there is a suspected danger of neglect or abuse. In some states, the possession of a controlled substance in the presence of a child is a felony. These laws may be a deterrent to a pregnant woman uh, seeking prenatal care. Programs that incorporate supportive services, such as assistance with housing, employment, transportation, and childcare, can help lower the barriers that stand between women and effective care. Further, programs that engage children and family members in therapeutic settings can help women get on the path to recovery that addresses their concerns as caregivers for their children. For women with opioid use disorders, medication-assisted treatment, which combines FDA-approved medicines with psychosocial therapies, generally is an appropriate and useful option. Methadone is the standard of care for treating opioid use disorders in pregnant women, and research has shown great promise in buprenorphine as a, uh, another option as well. While research shows that these medications may result in a newborn experience withdrawal after pregnancy, it is important to keep in mind that these medications can increase the chance that a woman will have a stable pregnancy, enter recovery, and be able to care for her baby. It is also important to keep in mind that such treatment is generally conducted as part of a comprehensive treatment plan that emphasizes prenatal health for both mother and newborn. We must recognize and meet the needs of women providing treatment that is effective, accessible, and affordable regardless of their socioeconomic status or justice involvement. Science and safety should inform our policies and our laws. We need to encourage women to access care uh, using expanded insurance coverage under the Affordable Care Act, and we should also recognize the need to match them into appropriate treatment, incorporating screening and referral to specialty treatment into standardized medical care. Laws that discourage women from seeking treatment should be reviewed and the safety of children considered as we review how to get women into treatment that they need. You will hear from many experts today on effectively treating women with substance use disorders, addressing their trauma, trauma and helping them sustain their recovery. We look forward to discussing how we can address drug use and substance use disorders among women and in ways that we can work together to support them along with their children. Thank you. My name is Radonna Chandler, and I work at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today talking about this very important topic of women and addiction. I want to start by thanking Senators Whitehouse, Portman, Ayot, and Kobachar for hosting this event. And I am particularly pleased that they have chosen to start this panel with science, with evidence that we, about what we know with regard to the etiology and the treatment of substance use and addictive disorders among women. I work, as I said earlier, at the National Institute on Drug Abuse where we support almost all of the research that's conducted around the world on substance use and addiction. And it is very important, we believe, to build an evidence base so that those who are struggling with addiction can have treatment provided to them that we don't just think it works, we don't just believe it works, but our data indicate that it is effective and can be helpful. Everything from behavioral treatments to medications. And I am pleased this morning to have the opportunity to be the moderator for this panel and to start by introducing Dr. Christine Grella, who is from the University of California in Los Angeles. She is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry, and she is also the Associate Director of the Integrated Substance Abuse Programs. I've known Dr. Grella for many, many years. She has a, a long history of research where she has examined substance use and treatment, treatment utilization, and the relationship of service delivery to treatment outcomes. She has focused particularly on women, on women who are involved in the criminal justice system, and on some of the deleterious outcomes, including homelessness and co-occurring mental health disorders. She is very widely recognized on the national and international stage. She is well published, and it is a pleasure to have her lead this panel this morning. Ready?
Thank you, Rajana. And I want to thank the organizers of this session. And I'm very, very grateful to be here today to talk about a topic that I feel very passionate about. And my job today is to give you an overview of the issues concerning addiction treatment for women. Let's move to the next slide. Um, and as is fitting, I like to begin with a historical moment. This is a picture of the first addiction treatment program for women in the United States. It was called Martha Washington House. And um, you can see from 1869. And the image is one of a very bucolic, beautiful rest home. Most likely the women going into this program were addicted to opiates, which were freely available at that time. Next slide. This contrasts with an image from several decades later from the Federal Narcotics Farm that was established in Lexington, Kentucky. The Federal Narcotics Farms were the first federal drug treatment programs in the United States. Only about 10% of the patients were women. This was a combination hospital penitentiary. But I think this image says so much about the issues that we confront with the topic of addiction in women. You can see this young woman who's holding her face in shame. And we've heard discussion about shigma, stigma and its association with addiction for women. And I'll be talking about that in my presentation as we go on. Next slide. So my topics that I'm going to cover have to do with giving you an overview on the prevalence of substance use disorders among women and men, treatment seeking and barriers to treatment seeking, the clinical profile, treatment uh, programs and services available, retention and outcomes, and service system issues. So I'll begin with just some basic facts about the prevalence of substance use disorders among men and women. Most of the data that I'm presenting today comes from national survey data sponsored either by SAMHSA or by NIH. Here we see the prevalence of lifetime drug use disorders among men and women in the U.S. population. And there is roughly a two to one ratio of, subs of drug use disorders with men having approximately double the prevalence of drug use disorders, although that has been lessening in the most recent years, particularly as we've heard already today around prescription opiates and stimulants. If we move to the next slide, we'll see um, a similar slide on the prevalence of past year substance use disorders, including this time alcohol. So again, roughly a two to one ratio, but increasingly among some of the illicit drugs and prescription drug users, a closing of that gap. Let's move on. So then the question is um, treatment seeking. Um, what proportion of those who have these disorders in the population actually seek out some kind of treatment? So in the first slide here, the first half of the slide, we can see that about 6% of the US population of women age 12 and older meet criteria for a substance use disorder meriting a need for treatment. So 6%. So the question is, of those, how many actually receive treatment? And it's a well-known and very robust finding um, that about 85% of those with a substance use disorder actually never receive or do not seek treatment for their disorder, usually out of denial or minimizing the problem. About 11% of women do receive some kind of treatment, and about 5% say they have a problem but they didn't seek help for it. So let's move on and see what are some of the reasons. This actually is another slide showing uh, a broader range of help-seeking disparity uh, for the lifetime. Over the lifetime, about a quarter of women with a substance use disorder will seek some kind of help um, as a, compared to about 31% of men. So we know there's a disparity in help-seeking. So the question is, what are the reasons for that disparity? So we're going to take a pause from Dr. Grella's presentation so that we can allow an opportunity for Senator Portman to come up and say a few words as one of the co-hosts of this event. Donna, thank you. I was enjoying listening to that. Um, so I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I was uh, sitting over there actually learning, uh, which is always, always uh, you know, important in this field, given all the, all the challenges that we have. So thank you all for being here. Redonna, thank you. And uh, to folks who are here today, uh, we, we really appreciate your willingness to give us some advice and counsel. This is our second forum we've had. The first one resulted in 
such uh, a wealth of information that we've actually started working on legislation in response to it, uh, specifically focused on uh, heroin and prescription drug addiction. And uh, we are looking at introducing something uh, probably in September. And um, we don't know exactly what the outlines of the bill are, but we have a pretty good idea based on uh, the input that we've gotten. So if you have interest in following up with us on the general issue of uh, heroin addiction and prescription drug addiction, we'd, we'd, we'd still love to get your input. Um, Megan's here from our team. Um, Jessica, how are you? Jess is helping on this and others. So please, please let us know. Senator Whitehouse and I will be introducing it. Uh, Senator Ayotte and Senator Klobuchar, as you know, are helping us to co-sponsor this event. And um, again, I, I appreciate the input that, that we're receiving, and I do hope to hear a little more myself. Um, in our country right now, we have a, a quiet epidemic. And I use the word epidemic advisedly, but in my own state of Ohio, we'll probably have uh, 2,000 people die of overdoses this year. And it's shifting, as you know, uh, from prescription drug overdoses toward more heroin overdoses. And um, yet people really aren't focused on it. So by far the leading cause of death now, uh, not just in Ohio, but probably in your state. Uh, we also have some really good evidence of what works and what doesn't work. And so what you'll hear today is, uh, as you were starting to hear here, is some of the science uh, behind this. And I think, frankly, one of the issues we've had uh, over the years, and I've been involved on the prevention side for over 20 years now, including starting our own coalition back home that I chaired uh, for about nine years. But one of the issues we've had, frankly, is you know the, the lack of evidence-based um, approaches sometimes and, and the research to be able to ensure that we are putting the best practices to work. So I, I love these fora because it gives us an opportunity to hear from some of the experts to get some of the science, to understand it better, and to be able to make more progress uh, on, on these tough issues, not just on uh, prevention and education, which I think is still the area that deserves uh, the most attention relative to, to what it's getting, but also obviously on treatment and recovery and uh, what works and, and what doesn't work. So. Um, again, I thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, this is a specific focus today on, on women and how, as I just heard, you know, to get more women into treatment because there's often uh, the sense of denial or concern or embarrassment or stigma. Um, and then also trying to get women more involved um, on the prevention education side and on the recovery side. Um, we, we think uh, in the United States of America today, about 18 women die each day from overdose. And that has increased by about 400% since 1999. So again, it's kind of a, a quiet but, but, but very real problem that uh, requires much more, much more focus. Uh, Lori Chris is here from the Ohio Council of Behavioral Health and Family Services Providers, and I appreciate her coming. Um, and Margo Spence is from First Step home in Cincinnati, which is a great residential and out-treatment program in Ohio. And finally, uh, Pamela Trapiano is here from CareSource Ohio to talk about uh, her work on drug uh, and alcohol addiction treatment. So I'm proud of Ohio for being at the cutting edge. Uh, and uh, I just, I just uh, again, thank you everybody for coming today. I don't want to get in the way of further uh, information here from our panelists. and. Uh, uh, again, we look forward to working with you on this legislation we're hoping to introduce in September. I'm sure we'll get more information today about that. And in general, uh, I just want you all to know that although this is a, uh, as I said, a quiet epidemic that's not getting the attention it deserves, that on a bipartisan basis, uh, Senator Whitehouse, myself, and Senator Ayotte, Klobuchar, and others are going to ensure that this issue does get raised up and that we do help to provide better resources at the federal level to address it. Thank you all. So to, to resume, we were, I was just presenting some data on uh, showing that the vast majority of both men and women don't seek 
some kind of help, whether it's treatment or other forms of intervention for their substance use disorders. But here we'll look at some data that show gender differences in that area. There are slight differences with regard to alcohol and drug problems, but generally the patterns are, as we can see, women, a higher proportion of women cite financial problems as a barrier, stigma, as we've been hearing about throughout the morning so far, and fear of treatment, fear of the consequences of treatment. That could be loss of custody, fear of legal consequences. Let's move on. Again, a similar pattern with drugs, but even more exacerbated, even more difference in terms of the fear and the stigma as barriers for treatment seeking. Moving on to the next slide. I think it's really important also to acknowledge that women as a group are not homogeneous, and there are lots of variability among women by age. And in this slide, we're looking at differences by race and ethnicity in terms of the barriers to seeking treatment. Uh, white women tend to uh, be more likely to report stigma as a barrier or fear of treatment. African-American women, much more likely to report structural barriers, lack of transportation, structural inability to access treatment. Treatment pessimism is also a factor for white women and African-American women. Let's move on. Uh, similar slide showing, in this case, uh, the barriers by race and ethnicity for drug treatment. Stigma, again, looming very large, even more so than with regard to alcohol. And structural barriers predominating among African American and Latino women. So let's shift to when uh, women actually go into treatment, where do they go? We see very different patterns by gender. Uh, we can move. Um, Women are less likely than men to go into the traditional rehab program. And most likely that's because, as we saw earlier in the slides on prevalence, those rehab programs were designed with the assumption traditionally of a male client. And women are less likely to go into those programs. However, they're more likely to seek some kind of substance abuse treatment or to present that problem to a doctor, a social worker, a psychologist, as well as mental health settings. And that probably stems from the fact that women with substance dis use disorders tend to have higher rates of co-occurring mental health disorders, usually anxiety or depression. So they may present their substance use disorder to a mental health professional in mental health settings. Uh, moving on, same uh, data, but with regard to drug problems, even more exacerbated. Women less likely to go into the rehab programs for their drug problems more likely to seek from a private caregiver. Um, and also, I might note, less likely to participate in a or 12-step programs. And there are alternative models that have been designed to be uh, more female-focused. So less availability to go, less likelihood to go into the traditional programs and models. So let's move on. Um, this is actually data from a study I did use, based on a NIDA-funded multi-site study. We went a little deeper into the psychosocial profiles that are associated with treatment access and utilization. It was very striking to me. If you look at the uh, column on the left, for men, they cited their spouse was opposed to their substance use, but their family was highly supportive of them going into treatment. Or they had a referral through some kind of social system, their family, an employer, the criminal justice system. The profile for women is strikingly different. Treatment utilization for women was associated with um, factors that speak to um, the, the deficits that they have in social resources, single moms, uh, women who initiated into treatment by themselves. They may have been imposed, in fact, by going to treatment by their spouses or partners. Referral by a social worker, antisocial personality, and having it been involved with sex work. Factors that got them noticed above the radar, so to speak, contact with the criminal justice system. So the profile, very, very different in terms of not just willingness to seek treatment, but the support and resources for doing so. Let's move on. We know from a considerable amount of research that's in agreement that when women do go into a treatment program, they present with a profile of greater clinical severity. This is a very robust finding across many clinical studies. They have tended to move more quickly through the substance use uh, and initiation, onset of dependence, moving into treatment. They have more clinical severity, more co-occurring mental health disorders, as I mentioned. They have more deficits with regard to employment and vocational skills. 
history of trauma and abuse, we'll hear more of that later on the other panel. HIV risk factors often higher than men because of their involvement in sex work or risky sex partners. Parenting responsibilities, child welfare involvement, and interpersonal problems and conflicts. So they present with a profile that the typical rehab models that were designed for male clients may not be prepared to address. So let's move on. So let's look at the treatment system and what's out there for women. If we look overall, you can move on, at the treatment system, approximately 8,000 treatment facilities, substance abuse treatment facilities in the United States. 35% of them, this is survey data collected by SAMHSA, state that they provide some special service or program for women. So slightly over one third of the programs in our treatment system say that they do something to accommodate women's needs. I don't have to make the statement that that's shockingly low, and then we think back about the resistance, the fear, the barriers to treatment seeking, and in fact, when we look at the overall treatment system, it's a minority of those programs that have accommodated, to some extent, women's needs. What are they likely to do? This slide shows us the services that are available in those programs that say they have done some special programming, and I should add, I hate to say special programming for women shouldn't be considered special, but they've done something to address women's needs. It's most often domestic violence services, about 32%, trauma-related, pregnancy and child care related. But as you can see, this is even a minority of those programs that are saying they do something to address women's needs. Let's move on. Back, back. With regard to treatment outcomes, there's been a plethora of studies that have addressed the issue of gender and treatment outcomes. This slide summarizes data from 38 studies and a meta-analysis looking what are the common elements that are associated with improved retention and outcomes among women who do go into those treatment programs. And we can see they are the very services that I just showed you are lacking in our programs. So the services that are addressed, women's needs, childcare, prenatal care and pregnancy, women-only programs, trained counselors who can address women's needs, specialized services, mental health services, longer and more intense services. I might also add more recently, we have data that administering medication, medication-assisted therapy, also beneficial to women, including during pregnancy. So we know the programs, the services that do better. We know they are also the minority of the programs in the treatment system. So this is just a, a simple bar graph showing very dramatically the difference in days retained in treatment among women in residential programs. You can see very dramatically in programs with childcare, child capacity, much more improved retention, and similarly, women who are in women-specific programs do much better in terms of retention. So what do we know about outcomes? Um, the research is very mixed. Do men do better, women do better? It's really not a simple answer to that question. Women do better in treatment when they get those services, when they get the specialized services that addresses that profile that I showed you a moment ago of the greater clinical severity, the co-occurring mental health problems, the vocational deficits. When they are treated in those programs, trauma-informed programs, they tend to do better. But a simple gender comparison often doesn't address that question because you're often looking at programs that don't include those evidence-based components. Let's move on. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes at the very end talking about system level issues because we can talk about women's fear of treatment and the fear of stigma, but part of it is what are the barriers they encounter when they do try to access treatment. We know there's limited capacity in terms of access to those programs that provide the specialized services for women. We know that often it's hard to get in the programs and there's a wait list, particularly for a woman who has children and has logistical issues caring for her children. And we know that women come into treatment through various pathways, the criminal justice system, the child welfare system, the mental health system, and often those pathways are not coordinated, leading to fragmented care. So structural barriers, often uh, their level of impairment may not be severe enough to merit going into treatment, so they have substance use problems but with the limited capacity, they're not able to access it. Um, level of treatment availability, again, particularly related to childcare capacity is limited, and limited coordination of care. <clears throat> we can go on. 
So this is just a graphic showing the interrelated pathways through treatment. We know that women are likely to enter treatment from any of these systems, and their treatment is improved with greater coordination of care across these systems so that their multiple problems can be addressed within the context of treatment. Next slide, please. So just to summarize, um, we know that men and women follow different pathways into treatment. They encounter different barriers when they attempt to access treatment and they present with differing clinical profiles. We know from a great deal of evidence that the treatment services that address women's specific needs and are, are associated with better retention and outcomes, yet we also know that most women with substance abuse problems not only do not seek treatment, but among those who do, they are unlikely to be able to access those specialized services because they do not exist throughout the treatment system in its entirety. So I will conclude at that point, and um, thank you for your attention. Chris, that was great. Um, you walked us through a lot of science very efficiently, and I really appreciate the points that you made. Our next presenter is uh, Lori Chris. Lori is the Associate Director of the Ohio Council of Behavioral Health and Family Services, uh, she, uh, which is an organization that represents nonprofits that provide addiction treatment as well as prevention services, mental health, and family services and interventions. She has nearly 20 years of experience, particularly within the area of leadership for gender-specific uh, addiction needs, trauma treatment, housing, and family services for women. Her current work extends into areas of recovering ho recovery housing, opioid-affected pregnancies, and families that integrate physical and behavioral health care. She holds a master's degree of social work from Ohio State University, and she was one of the founding members of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration's work group on women's sober housing and treatment, and she graduated from SAMHSA's Women's Addiction Services Leadership Institute. And she is here to talk to us a little bit about some of the work that is happening across her state. Good morning, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm really grateful to be here today and have the opportunity to share the learning that we've done in Ohio and across the country with some, some colleagues. Um, as, as was said, I've worked in women's treatment for over 20 years, and the large emphasis of my work has been in operating and in working with other programs that operate treatment and housing that are specifically designed to meet the needs of women and their children. And so my comments today are really grounded in that work from my own experience and from the experience that we've collected from other providers with uh, similar philosophies. Addiction, as, as um, Dr. Grella was, was saying, affects all impacts of a, a woman's life. And because of this, the programs that work with women are are not just addressing their clinical treatment needs with addiction, they're also coordinating with primary care providers and hospitals and federally qualified health centers and clinics. They're working with um, pre-release centers and judges and drug courts and family courts and jails and prisons. They're working with family courts and caseworkers, GED programs, community colleges, um, local continuum of care, landlords, public housing authorities, you're getting the sense that a women's treatment program isn't just about addiction treatment. It's very broad and about a woman's overall health and wellness and her ability to function and, and really sustain wellness on a long-term basis through sobriety, through economic independence and stability, and through residential stability as well. And if a woman has children, these programs are also working with daycares and local school systems and helping families help children succeed in those environments. They're working with prevention programs and early intervention programs as well so that these children and youth who are high risk for potential addiction in their future also have the opportunity to have 
a strong foundation for their own development as they move forward. So gender-specific treatment is more than just an individual psychotherapy session or, or medical um, attention and medication-assisted treatment. It's a program-based service that holistically meets the needs of women as they move through their recovery process. When I was, um, you mentioned that I founded the SAMHSA work group on women, housing, and treatment, and that opportunity created a network of women's treatment programs that also offer housing, safe and sober housing for women in recovery and for their children. And in that work, we had the opportunity to do some focus groups, some interviews, some in-person learning dialogues, and, and documented the outcomes from that work. There were several things that we identified as essential elements for effective programming and supports for women with addiction issues. The first was that they're women focused, and Dr. Grella already spoke about that, but it's recognizing that not just that women experience addiction and recovery differently than men do, but also honoring the multiple roles that women have in their lives. So knowing that their mothers, their wives, their partners, their daughters, their sisters, their neighbors, their employees, and that often they're, they're themselves, they're women last, and they don't necessarily always focus on themselves. So it takes some creative attention to help them slow down and recognize that they need to do this not only for themselves, but for all the other folks in their lives and who are supportive of their recovery. These programs also emphasize the importance of alcohol and drug-free environments. Women need these abstinence-based environments that will help cushion them from a world where alcohol and drug use was the central focus of their day-to-day -day activities. And they need an opportunity to be in an environment where they can shift that focus to other healthy relationships and activities that they can pursue outside of drug and alcohol use. This may include a treatment center that's alcohol and drug-free, a drop-in center that's alcohol and drug-free, or recovery housing, a place to live and go back to 24-7 where they can find safety and security with other people who are in recovery, and that their children can find that stability as well. We know that it takes an extended time for someone to recover, that um, it, it's not just about getting the information, it's about practicing a newly acquired skill set and, and applying that on a day-to-day -day basis in their lives. So um, we need to move away from the idea that acute care is what works in addictions treatment, that someone can go into treatment for seven, 10, 30, 90 days and come out and be healed. That's not what works with recovery. It's not what works with recovery for women. They need an extended period of time, and it may be two to five years of ongoing recovery support because it's a chronic disease like diabetes or MS where people need the opportunity to plug into medical services occasionally for, for treatment or for checkups where they need ongoing other recovery supports that will promote their, their long-term sobriety. Community was another essential element of the, the programs that, that we worked with. You may hear, if you're in or around the recovery community long enough, you may hear the phrase people, places, and things. The, who we hang out with, where we go, the things that we do, those largely define who we are and create our identity and the opportunities that lie ahead of us in our lives. And we know that by providing a sense of community where women connect with other peers in recovery, with professionals who are focused on their wellness, and have that, that safe opportunity to be in a community where they'll, they'll be in an alcohol and drug-free environment and have that support for recovery is, cannot be underestimated how powerful that is to supporting a woman in her long-term recovery. The communities that, that are created, these communities of recovery, have celebrations of recovery milestones or other successes, getting a GED. We've celebrated kids being potty trained. I mean, little life successes that don't always get celebrated are the things that a community of recovery and women's specific treatment get celebrated on a day-to-day -day basis. We also have community meetings and, and peer support, and these are essential um, because isolation and loneliness are really the worst enemy of a person uh, disabled by addiction. And women are often socialized not to trust one another. So through these communities of recovery, they connect to other people and they learn that they can have safe and healthy relationships with other women and with men in their lives. 
The programs we've worked with have recovery-oriented relapse policies, so they're flexible approaches to relapse so that women can create individualized care plans. We know that relapse is a time for assessment and re-engagement. It's not a time for termination from a program. We're also very focused on safety, so not just physical safety, but emotional and psychological safety as well. Many of the women in these programs have experienced significant trauma, and we'll hear about that later, and they've lived in environments where they haven't necessarily felt safe and comfortable, and their children haven't as well. These families express that this is the first time their kids could go to a neighbor's house and play, and they knew that they were safe. They knew there wouldn't be weapons or drugs or alcohol in that environment, and that it was a neighbor that they could trust. And we know that, that creating safety is also about facilitating independence and autonomy for the women, especially if they have a strong history of domestic violence or abuse. So supporting women in their own economic independence became part of the safety factor as well. Let me go back one more slide. I'm almost done with Outcomes are focused beyond abstinence, so abstinence is a goal of recovery, it's a cornerstone of recovery, but it's not the only thing that will keep someone in long-term recovery or help someone achieve that. They need to be focused on uh, healthy relationships and parenting. Um, we know that the well-being of children is first and foremost on the minds of, of mothers who are in gender-specific treatment programs. And we know that kids would rather be nowhere else than with their mother and living with their mother. And so creating opportunities for family-centered interventions, for family support, is vital for gender-specific treatment. It's really hard for a mom to focus on her own wellness if she's not sure where her kids are, who they're living with, how they're doing in school. All of those things will rise to the front of her priorities if, if they're not together. And then employment becomes um, a significant uh, part of these programs as well, or pursuit of purpose, because we really need to look at the culture of, of the women in the programs. There were some programs where intergenerational relationships existed in families. Women weren't necessarily going to work or, or pursuing employment. It was their role to be providing childcare so that other people could do that in their family. So helping them see what the most vital role is for them to exist within their family context. But many women are pursuing GEDs, going to community college, getting their now job that will help give them the income they need for um, rent and utilities and food, and pursuing their someday job that will give them the career that helps them thrive and really feel connected to the person they were meant to be. So as, as I looked at um, what we were talking about today and the programs and what they've said they, they need to do to generate their effective outcomes, I started to think about the policy barriers that make it difficult to design and operate these programs and make it difficult for people with substance use disorders to succeed in their recovery. First and foremost is that addiction is not recognized by, as a disability by the Social Security Administration. And this is a definition that is used in creating and managing other beneficiary programs. So when you hear people say people with disabilities have access to Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security income, housing, rent, and utility vouchers, um, vocational rehabilitation services, that's very true for people with severe mental disabilities, for severe physical disabilities, for developmental disabilities. But it's not true for a person who's primarily or solely disabled by substance use disorders. And I'm not suggesting that we change the definition with the Social Security Administration, but we need to know that when we embed that definition into program designs and resource allocation, we're excluding a large percentage of the population. 22 million people who have addiction are not able to access income, have access to medical services, have access to uh, employment services that they vitally need, or rent and utility subsidies that they vitally need, even temporarily, in order to pursue and sustain their wellness. Two specific policies right now that are creating challenges in the, the recovery community and the treatment community are the Medicaid IMD rule, uh, Institutions for Persons with Mental Disability. It's a 50-year-old rule that was originally created to help mitigate financial responsibility at the federal level for state psychiatric hospital inpatient stays. 
And eventually it was applied to residential treatment, inpatient treatment, and detox for substance use disorders as well. The practical outcome of this is that in order to operate a residential treatment program or a detox program and receive Medicaid so that you can serve low-income persons, you're capped at 16 beds. 16 beds is not enough capacity when you hear that there's been a 400% increase in opiate addiction in our country. We know that 16 beds can't meet that need, and we know that detox is often a vital first step for people with opiate addiction into their recovery. And it's also not a very smart business practice, frankly. 16 is not a cost effective. That's not where any investor or, or business person would break off their uh, cost benefit analysis in operating that kind of service. So it, it really doesn't create an efficient business model either. The second is that HUD has um, begun to prioritize permanent housing in their efforts to end homelessness. And that's an evidence-based practice that's significantly valuable for a lot of populations. But for persons with substance use disorders, they need a range of housing choices that may include a, a transitional housing option that's more service enriched than the permanent housing options that are available through, through HUD's resources. So in current practice, transitional housing is no longer part of the continuum of care homeless options. And local communities are beginning to close or, or shift transitional housing programs into a permanent housing model that isn't necessarily culturally or, or structurally appropriate for a person in early recovery. And so we're advocating for housing choice and that, that a continuum of options needs to be available in local communities in order to meet the needs of people with substance use disorders. And in closing, I'd just like to, to highlight some of the policy actions that we're pursuing in Ohio and, and hoping to see pursued at the federal level as well. Um, first of all, payment reform. We talked a lot about program-based services and the need for chronic disease management and outcome-based payment. And the current fee-for-service environment really doesn't allow for the flexibility and creativity that providers need, that systems need to meet the needs of women and their children in their recovery goals. And so program or payment reform is essential. We'd like HUD policies and resources that promote housing choice. We want both um, mainstream affordable housing that doesn't require an alcohol and drug-free environment and people can be motivated towards recovery, and we want alcohol and drug-free recovery-focused supportive service-enriched environments where people who are in recovery can sustain that safe living environment. We're advocating for the elimination of the IMD rule, and we know that while this would take uh, congressional action, and there are some proposals that are, are emerging right now. We also think there's some administrative policy changes that could bring more immediate relief. We need capacity in local communities today, and um, having a, a longer-term legislative fix might actually result in lost lives and unnecessary suffering. And then finally, we're supportive of continued investment in SAMHSA's Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant. These dollars are one of the largest investments in gender-specific women's treatment and prevention programs that our nation has, and they should be a source of pride for us, and they should be something that continues because they allow us to fund the glue that holds recovery together, those services that may not meet medical necessity, may not be covered by insurance, but definitely result in positive outcomes for women and for their children long-term. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Lori. Our next speaker is Patricia Sams. She is the administrator for Building Hope Recovery Incorporated, which is a faith-based organization that promotes Celebrate Recovery Step meetings, outreach to individuals who are struggling with addiction in jails, prisons, and hospitals, transitional housing, and community services programs within the Stone County, Missouri, and surrounding areas. As vice president of this organization, she instructs members and provides continuing education on implementing best practices for peer-run organizations. She's a national speaker and a trainer. She has experience in training individuals in things like the use of medication-assisted treatment for alcoholism and opiate addiction. 
She also very importantly has 40 years of personal experience with generational alcoholism, successful completion of the Stone County DWI court program, along with medication-assisted treatment. She's maintained complete abstinence from alcohol and promotes a life in recovery. So she has rich experience to share with us this morning. And thank you all for um, allowing me to come and represent millions of women who are still suffering from my story that I'm going to tell. And as I'm telling this story, um, please just keep in mind that my story is not unique. And everything that you hear um, is being played out at this very moment all the way from one end of the nation to the next. And this is a very, very serious epidemic. And I am so grateful that there, this opportunity to speak on behalf of women and that we are focusing on women and their needs has come to be. I am a generational alcoholic. I come from generations and generations where alcohol is just part of who we are. So growing up in an abusive um, family with an alcoholic father and um, all aunts and uncles, everything that we did, um, alcohol was involved. We were functioning, we were educated, we worked. You didn't miss work because you had a hangover. But the severity of the alcoholism in our family caused um, domestic violence on a regular basis. I watched family members die from the disease of alcoholics, alcoholism and drug addiction. And when I was younger going through the tangled mess of, of what houses live in with alcoholic parents. My mother did not drink. Um, she grew up in a family of drinkers. So she was, she was the backbone of our family as far as working, and she was an enabler because she just didn't know any different. So growing up in that, I swore as a, as a child that I was not going to grow up and be like that and that I was not going to treat my, my children like that and I wasn't gonna have them in an environment like that. And the truth was, um, I grew up and I became just that. I was picked up for my eighth DUI when I was 40 years old. And leading up to that DUI, I became a mother and I was incarcerated. Com combined 44 months between jail and prison for my drunk drivings. My son grew up with my mother after he was nine through his teen years and his most impressionable years. And he watched me go in and out of jail and he watched me escalate into a person that he didn't even know. The thing was, I would go into jail and I would come out and I continued to drink. And I would go back into jail and the cycle just continued because no one told me that I had a disease. And no one told me that if it was left untreated that it would progress. And that I would build up a tolerance. And that eventually I, I would drink myself to death. I knew that that was a possibility because I watched other family members do that. But I just thought that's who I was. So I continued to drink and I continued to go in and out of jail. And going back into, into jail, the officers would go, didn't you learn the last time? Yeah, I learned how to make hooch. I learned about the alcohol content in our extracts that you use for cooking and vanilla and that if I couldn't get to any alcohol that I could drink these things until I could, I could supply myself with more um, NyQuil and drinking it really fast and the high alcohol content and that. Those are the things that I learned in jail. We didn't have 12-step um, programs in there. I learned about making your own wine. I, these are the things that I learned when I was in there. And actually when I went to prison, I was given a certificate that I had successfully completed AA. Yeah. I think it was requirement by prison-run um, inmate 
run that you just showed up for these meetings and there was like eight of them you had to sign your name to and then you got this pretty certificate that said you graduated. So at that point, I was no longer an alcoholic because I had a degree to prove that. I went through the classes. The sad part about that is um, when, I, when I was released from prison, I made it two weeks before I was released from parole when I got another drunk driving. And the thing was, I had only white knuckled it for two months after I was released. And I just could not not, not drink. I didn't know why. By the time I was arrested for my eighth DUI in Stone County, I had been living in a room and my alcoholism had escalated to the point that I couldn't function and I couldn't move. I was using a bucket next to my bed to go to the bathroom because I couldn't make it to the bathroom. I was continuously waking up in my own vomit. And in order to just sit up, I had to drink. But I would throw that up and I would just keep drinking until I kept it down because I couldn't sit up or move or do anything otherwise. I was going to sleep. I call it sleep. I was passing out and each time I would start to fade out. I was praying that God would just take me. I had no quality of life. And during this time, leading up to this, my son started following in the same footsteps. But before that, he was very, very confused. He couldn't understand why mom loved alcohol more than him. He became a cutter, and he had to be institutionalized. At 17, he was, he was arrested for possession of marijuana. And he was doing the same that I taught him, that my parents had taught me. And that was to medicate ourselves on things that we didn't understand. Judge Alan Blankenship in the middle of the woods in a county, Stone County, Missouri, is where I was arrested for my eighth DUI. And I was very sick. And that was when I was in that room. I don't remember that arrest. I remember waking up inside of a cell and I was handcuffed to a pipe. And that's pretty severe. You're in a locked room and you're handcuffed to a pipe. Judge Blankenship got all of my records because the majority of my life I was from Michigan. And in Michigan there wasn't any treatment and it was just, it was jail at that time, and it was in and out of jail, and that was what they considered, you know, that you were gonna learn. You were gonna get your incarceration time, and, and you were gonna sit there long enough, and you were gonna think about it, and then you were gonna go out and be a productive member of society. So when he looked at my record, the assistant prosecutor was absolutely refusing to hear anything about treatment because um, I was an habitual offender and a huge, huge risk to society. So um, he wanted me to go and do seven years prison. And Judge Blankenship presented my file to them and he said, this lady has never had any help. She's never had any treatment. And the day that he looked at me in court, which was the first strange thing that ever happened in a courtroom for me because um, a judge never ever looked at me in the previous um, experiences that I had. But he looked at me and he called me, called me by my name and he said, you need help and we can help you. He made a phone call and he, he got me into um, a treatment program. It was an inpatient treatment program. But upon, when I was supposed to arrive for that and I tried to quit drinking because I really wanted to, to do right um, by the judge in, in this opportunity. So I had quit drinking um, the night before and I did not know at this time that um, severe intoxication of alcoholism and you just quit will kill you. So when, as I was getting ready for, um, to try and get there to the, to the court and I was really weak and I couldn't stand, I had lost body functions and my body had started um, shutting down. And so I called the treatment center and I told them that um, I think I have the flu and 
they said, well, if judge said that you need to be in here, then the flu or no flu, you need to get in here. So it was really a good thing. I got there, and they had to send me to the hospital. I had five days of medical detox, and then I had 28 days into the residential program. Before I was to leave the program, I started getting really scared because I had never, ever been able to not drink. And I really didn't want to drink. Judge had sent over a request that I be um, screened for Vivitrol. And I had never heard anything about this medication. The only medications I heard about was the medication that you took and then you would instantly throw up if you, if you drank with it. And I didn't want any part of that. Um, well, because I really didn't think I wouldn't be able to not drink. And I, I was doing a pretty good job of making myself sick from alcohol on my own and doing um, that. So I sat down and I went through the screening process and they gave me all the information on it. And you know, I just wanted it. And they were offering me a chance at, at a sober life. So when I was released, I went to um, the clinic and they gave me my first shot. And within three days, all of a sudden, my brain was quiet. For my whole life, there had always been something talking all the time about drinking. And then as I got older, and the more that I drank, the, more, the louder that voice was. And it, it was there for years. Everything that I did evolved around alcohol. All of my scheduling, all of our family events, everything evolved around drinking. And when that voice was gone, for a moment, I thought I, 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 thought I finally snapped to not have that constant echo in my head. At that point, I started getting what they were telling me about 12 steps and about recovery. I could hear them. I could hear them when they were explaining to me about the disease of alcoholism and about setting, setting the next steps in my life to be able to not be caught in that addiction cycle any longer. I made a call to my son, who at that time was a grown man. Well, he was a grown boy. He was 20. And hey, he hadn't talked to me in over a year because he, just, he was just done. And I asked him to come to Missouri, and I asked him to go through treatment because that's how it works. That's how it works. He didn't have a choice that I screwed him up. And I didn't want to give him a choice to get better. And the truth is, all he's ever wanted was just mom. He just wanted mom. So he came. And we went to counseling together. He was educated about the disease that is a potential hazard for him also that he was going into the same pattern with. He stuck around. I have a grandson now, and he just graduated with his medical assistance degree, and he doesn't drink. And because of this program and the medical assistant treatment, I have broken this, the cycle of addiction in my family. My grandson doesn't even have a clue of what that generational cycle is, and he won't. I am grateful for all of you that work in, in the field, and I am especially grateful for the, this women's group coming together to focus on, on women. I am someone's daughter, sister, I'm a wife, now I'm a complete mother. And I'm a grandmother. The nation needs their mothers back. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for your personal story. That is why I get out of bed and go to work every day. Um, our final speaker for this awesome panel 
is Trista Foreman, who is from the state of Rhode Island. She has an associate's degree in business management and is four months away from receiving her bachelor's degree in psychology with a focus on substance abuse. She is 28, she is married, and she is the mother of two girls. She lives in Warwick, Rhode Island, and she has struggled with substance use and addiction since she was 14 years old. She started using cocaine, and then she transitioned later to heroin. She began her drug use actually with her biological mother, who also had an addiction problem herself. She received help eventually from a behavioral health care nonprofit organization in Rhode Island where she entered into treatment. And she has been drug free and living a life of recovery for the past seven years. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that addiction, just as yours, has been in my family for generations. Um, as you just heard, my mother was an addict and used with me. Um, my grandmother raised me as a result of my mother being an addict, and she was incapable of raising me. I was her first child. Um, through the years, I, I watched her suffer, and coming by late hours, um, wanting money from my grandmother, uh, my grandmother missing money and jewelry, and um, watching my grandmother sit up and cry because she felt so helpless and didn't know what to do for my mother. Um, there was a period of time where my grandmother just kept her away because she didn't want it to affect me. But as I got older, I went and looked for her and it did affect me because she was still very much an addict. And um, I attribute her and I using together to addiction and, and the terrible things that it can do to a family. Um, by this time, she had two more children by the time her and I were using together. And when I would go to her house to use cocaine, there would be men in and out of the house. Um, my little sister is a victim of sexual abuse because one of the men um, who actually fathered my youngest brother uh, sexually abused her over and over and over. And my mother, um, when she told my mother, my mother didn't believe her and put her away. Um, and now she has grown to be an addict as well, as well as my other sister. I have a younger brother that's in and out of jail uh, just because of the lifestyle that he's used to. Um, I remember my mother bringing in a man one day that her and I were using and asking me if I would perform sexual acts in exchange for cocaine, and I did. I feel like that set the pace for me. I, I was already dealing with depression and anxiety, and I felt worthless, and I didn't feel good enough. And getting high made all that go away for a brief period of time. When I get high, um, Nothing, I didn't think of any of that. Nothing mattered. And, and my mother and I actually experienced, if you can believe it, good times when we were high, if you can call them good times. And at that point, I treasured them because it was, it was this bond that I had been longing for. Um, even though she was absent for, for a while during my younger days, um, I still always felt like I wanted her to be there, even though she, at that point I was seeing how the terrible things she was doing. And it, it was odd because I knew when we were getting high together, I knew it was wrong, but I still wanted to do it because I wanted to be with her. As I get older, um, around the age of 19, I graduated to using heroin. 
Heroin can sometimes be called the ultimate painkiller. And it was for me. It took everything. Um, I ended up being homeless in the streets of Providence, um, wearing the same clothes for days and days on end. Uh, there were other women that were out there. There was a girl out there that was 16 years old and she was prostituting herself so that she could get high. And it was this vicious cycle because you'd go out, you'd hustle to get the money, and then you would get high, and then as soon as your high wore off, you would do it again. And it takes an enormous toll on women especially, men as well, but women especially, it takes a toll emotionally. It brings back those worthless feelings. Those, um, there's also this, you're in this routine and you're comfortable with being uncomfortable, if that makes any sense. Um, when I got arrested for shoplifting, I ended up going to jail and I did, um, I spent 60 days in jail and then was released on probation. I later violated my probation because I wasn't, at that point, I wasn't offered any help yet. And I went right back out to using. When I violated my probation and got sent back to jail, I was put on work release. They would drop me off in the morning at a um, old person's home, at a nursing home, so that I could do the laundry in the back and they would pick me up at the end of the day. One of those days, I was still sick from, from the heroin, and I was still detoxing. And I took off, um, I'm watching Ripta, that's the, the local bus go by every day, and I had had enough, I didn't wanna be sick anymore. And I took the bus, and I ended up taking um, a little van, you pay them $30 and they take you to New York and they drop you off. I didn't know anybody in New York, I just knew that I had just escaped from prison and I needed to get out of Rhode Island. Uh, when they dropped me off, I didn't know where I was. Later I found out I was in the South Bronx and um, Hunts Point and Lafayette. And that's where I experienced some of the heart worst times I could ever imagine. Around there, you can't just walk around um, by yourself. Men pick you up, they beat you up, they try to make you prostitute yourself for them. They, they offer you more drugs so that they can get that grasp on you. <sighs> I, by the time I, when detectives finally came and got me, I was sitting under, a, under um, stairs that you go up to to get on the subway, and I had a little blanket, and I would sit there and panhandle because I couldn't walk the streets anymore. It was too dangerous. The men out there wouldn't allow it. And when the detectives came, I hugged him, and I leapt into his arms, and he carried me to the car, and I was so happy that he had came to get me. I was so happy to be going back home to Rhode Island. Um, when I came back home, my grandmother, who was still alive at that point, had asked me if I was ready yet, and I, I told her that I was, and she took me to Kodak in Providence. And if it wasn't for them, I would have never been able to get clean uh, and off the streets and out of that terrible cycle. I got on methadone and soon after I, I got myself in school. My husband is in recovery as well and we started the, the journey of getting clean together and experiencing all the wonderful little things that we had missed while we were out there. Starting a family, having rent to pay, using bathrooms with running water, um, 
all those little things that you take for granted when you're homeless and, and using drugs. Um, I graduated with my associate's degree, and then later on I decided that I wanted to play a part in the lives of women, particularly young women, that are using drugs and, and caught in that vicious cycle of homelessness and drugs and prostitution and all the things that women have to do to get by when they're out there. And I went back and now I'm, as she said, in pursuit of a, a, a bachelor's degree in psychology with the focus on substance abuse. And I can't wait to help women overcome addiction. Thank you. You know, as, as people were speaking and the clock was ticking, Trista said to me, now, if you don't have time for me, that's okay. And I said, we're going to make time for you. And I'm really glad that we did. So I think we have time um, for some questions. We're going to take about 10 minutes for people to ask questions. And because this is being recorded, I'm going to have to repeat the question for the panelists. Um, so if anyone has questions at this time, please stand. So, so let me try to paraphrase your questions. The first one had to do with the, um, the Affordable Care Act and health care reform efforts across the country and the fact that in many cases insurance companies are not necessarily informed about evidence-based practices for addiction treatment. And so what can be done to help disseminate that kind of information to ensure that this is actually a lever that we can use um, for uptake of evidence-based treatment. And then the uh, second question I've already lost track of. Oh, primary care. What can be done, what can be done to address substance use and addiction within primary care settings? So we'll let Chris start, sure. Your questions are exactly where the field of substance abuse treatment, particularly the division that Donna um, Radonna is acting director of, of um, Epidemiology Services and Prevention at NIDA, because our number one issue is how to move addiction treatment, evidence-based addiction treatment, into those settings, such as federally qualified health centers, how to get better coordination of care between addiction providers who will see an increase in those who now have public insurance coverage so they can access treatment, and trying to educate the workforce to keep up with that increase in what we're expecting to see within both primary care settings where people under ACA can be screened for alcohol problems, not illicit drug problems. That's not covered in the current ACA mandate. We would like to see an expansion for coverage of drug screening as well. But your questions, I, I have to applaud. You are exactly where the field is going, how to integrate the evidence-based practices within primary health care and the broader array of service delivery systems through the health care system. My concern is that we need to be advocating for women's treatment within that po those policy changes. I don't know that it's being highlighted, which is why I'm thrilled to see this forum today, that women's treatment needs and evidence-based practices need to be part of those, those policy changes. So in, in addition to that, there's policy work around payment reform. And when I talked about that earlier, it, it could drive some of the changes. It, you know, what gets paid for gets done. And um, right now, in a fee-for-service environment, it's very focused on an acute care model and very focused on short-term interventions, minimizing expenses, and then best of luck after that. Um, and so with, with some well-thought-out payment reform that's more outcome-based and could really drive uh, practices towards chronic disease management and overall health for a person, not just their addiction recovery. That's what we're looking for. There are pilot projects um, for that with mental health and severe mental disability, but it's in, in Ohio at least, we don't have any significant projects that are directed specifically towards that type of work uh, for substance use disorders. And so the, the readiness of providers is not 
rapidly accelerating at the rate that it needs to for the competitive environment that's, that's starting. Ohio does have a project that they're starting now called the Moms Project, and Margot Spence is here, and she'll talk about that. And it does have more of that, uh, that uh, comprehensive approach to care in an integrated setting with primary care and addiction as a specialty treatment provider with some creative payment mechanisms that hopefully we'll be able to learn from and, and transfer knowledge to as well. So, so the, the question is, how do you address the needs of women with children and the provision of safe care and perhaps even being able to have children with their mothers when they are participating in treatment when there's a lack of a payment stream? Well, first I want to um, confirm exactly what you said. Um, the survey data that I showed that looks at the services that are provided for women across the treatment system, and there were 35% that provided some services for women, has been remarkably consistent over time if, and has been decreasing. So as shocking as it is that that's a small portion of the treatment system, it has decreased. There was a flurry of attention to the issue of pregnancy and substance use in the 80s with the prevalence of cocaine use, that has reduced. Um, and SAMHSA does have a pregnant and parenting women's initiative where they fund programs to provide these enhanced services. Maybe they fund 12 to 15 programs for three years, and that's a drop in the bucket. So you're absolutely right. I think this is where we need policy and advocacy. If we look at the states, states do have standards for how their block grant funds are spent with regard to women's services. There has been a lot of analysis of the state block mandate. It is highly variable. There are no consistent standards for the treatment of women, pregnant women, parenting women. States have tremendous discussion, uh, discretion around that, and there's no mandates to enforce the standards that do exist. Furthermore, with the um, Medicare waiver through the Affordable Care Act, many states have not expanded their public insurance systems, creating even more disparity. So clearly to me, what you said is correct. We know from our research the evidence-based practices that are effective, so this is an area for policy and advocacy. And I think we need to be very clear in our messaging around this. Um, when Patricia said we need, the nation needs their mothers back, that's absolutely right. And when Trista talked about um, the experience that she had in communities with how she was preyed upon by men, I mean, women don't get well unless communities are well. And women don't get well unless men are well. And we need to approach this as a family-centered issue. And yes, there are specific uh, evidence-based practices that should be uh, financed and endorsed for women in their own wellness, but we have to have a collective approach to this. In Ohio, um, we've, we've started to look at it, frankly, as a jobs issue. I mean, if, if people are suffering from a disease and we have a public health crisis that's risen to the level that it has, we don't have communities that attract businesses. We don't have people who are able to work. And in framing it that way, um, we've been able to make, to have new investments in addiction treatment services and new investments in prevention services. We're actually, we have 15 different pieces of legislation around opiate addiction and other recovery supports right now. So I, I think really making it um, a community issue rather than an addiction issue it will help us move things forward too. So two questions. The first was, what do we know from a research and evidence-based perspective about the biological, the unique biological components of addiction and treatment for women? And then the second, what do we know about evidence-based approaches for treating women um, as they, across the lifespan and as they age? Um, I'll, I'll start out by saying one thing um, at, at NIDA and at the NIH at large. Um, we have an increased focus right now at looking at the portfolio of research that we support, all the way from basic science through to um, the development of treatment interventions, and trying to ensure that we are looking at 
issues that are unique at a biological level for males and females, even at the level of the cell. So I am, I, I am often in the room with my institute director, Dr. Nora Volkoff, where she is asking if someone's presenting a study on a sample of 500, how many of those are women? Do you have any data specific to women? So these are questions that we are aware need to be addressed and that we are beginning to look at and to address. And there are some unique aspects related to women from a biological perspective that have bearing on treatment, and I'll let Chris follow up. Yes, I do think that is an area that is in tremendous need of development, and there is fabulous research going on in the area, particularly of epigenetics and gender and brain mechanisms. We're starting to see it. It's very slow. Um, where we have the best evidence, I think, is with regard to treatment of pregnant women, and later on we'll hear Dr. Andre Jones, who is an expert and will be able to address the issues of treating pregnant women. Um, and medications in particular, how medications work differently for men and women, and particularly considering pregnant women, which is an incredibly important area where we do have some evidence. But from the um, etiology of addiction and how that may differ for women, that's one of the areas where we need more science, and it is beginning. I do want to say one word about the lifespan issue. Um, we are not addressing adolescent girls for the most part today. They have tremendously different issues. They, we know throughout the lifespan, if women present a substance abuse treatment with more severe disorders, that is the same, if not more so, for adolescent girls who initiate use now increasingly earlier, presenting with more severe problems. For older women, we've been talking a lot about prescription drug abuse. Here is the big secret. Older women are abusing prescription medications and alcohol to much higher rates compared to their older male counterparts. So another invisible, hidden um, crisis that's developing. Okay, so our time is up. I think that many of the panelists will be staying for the rest of the morning. So those of you who had questions, um, please take the opportunity to speak with them. I want to thank everyone for being here today, for the work that you are doing, whether it is in science, whether it is in policy, advocacy, and treatment, whether it is in building um, your own healthy family and community. You're very inspirational, as I said earlier. Remind me about why I get up every day and go to work. So it's it's been a pleasure to spend some time with you all this morning. Thank you. My name is Tracy Gardner, and I am the co-director of policy at the Legal Action Center. Many of you may know my other director, Gabrielle Della Guerinere. And uh, Legal Action Center is the country's only law and policy advocacy organization that focuses on HIV, criminal justice, and addiction issues. And this goes right to um, our work as a direct legal services provider and policy advocacy. Um, we have our Washington folks here today, Dan Belknap, many of you know, Mark O'Brien's around. Um, and we are delighted to be able to work with uh, the senators who've put together this forum. Um, addiction and uh, its consequences have long been part of our 40-year history. And um, we are gratified and also um, exhausted over the opportunity that um, abounds. Um, so again, this panel is focusing on women, addiction, and motherhood. And it is not, um, as we focus on women and addiction and women's role as mothers, um, and it often defies rational thinking as we're trying to um, make good decisions to support women and in their special capacity as mothers, um, identifying strategies that work, having to um, navigate silos, because it's not just ever about addiction. And for women in communities in particular, we are talking about multiple systems, as were referred to before, 
for today, those, those systems aren't here, but we do need to keep them in mind because it will be one hand clapping unless we thoughtfully um, incorporate the other elements that affect women. And um, what I think also is going to be addressed and we have been addressing is that as the nature of addiction as a family disease, that um, we uh, err greatly when we try to separate mother and children as if one, one's health and well-being is more paramount than the other. In this issue, as in many others, they are inextricably linked. And so we are going to talk about programs and approaches that acknowledge that um, very important, very critical um, issue. Um, we have a stellar panel, and um, I'm going to trust that many people have received the information that's on the tables outside, and I won't embarrass um, the speakers too much with their illustrious bios, um, but it does look like we are going to be very thorough in this panel in having clinician and direct service provider and service provider in the intersection around criminal justice and women and addiction. And um, my special preference, not preference, but it's a delight to have an insurance company here. <laughs> a medical, a payer. Don't throw your shoes. An enlightened one. An enlightened one. We'll clone you afterward. Um, so, uh, without further ado, and we are gonna have questions, opportunity for questions afterward, and we are being taped. So there will be um, lots of bounce, I hope, from this. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Andre Jones, Dr. Andre Jones, who's the executive director of UNC Horizons, and she is also professor in obstetrics and gynecology at UNC School of Medicine. And she is going to talk to us about the clinical issues around treating pregnant and parenting women with substance use disorders. Dr. Jones. Thank you so much to the senators and to the staffers for all of your work to put this together today. It is truly an honor um, to have the opportunity to be a small voice for the women of the North Carolina who really do have a lot of hope. What I'm gonna share with you is one example of a treatment program that is working really well, um, that is truly dyad-centered. It focuses not just on the mom or on the child, but it's them together as a dyad, and where we say that we teach women and children to learn how to dance rather than how to wrestle and fight. Um, so next slide, please. So this is our model and our approach to care. First and foremost, you have to have an excellent clinical care program. I'm gonna tell you about the elements of that. Then I think that we also have to be training the next generation in what we're doing. So we have a huge commitment to training all of the learners from undergraduate to medical professionals, dentists, social service people, everybody who come, law enforcement actually, every single person who might come in contact with a woman of childbearing age who's using substances. They need to understand how to identify substance use disorders, and at least where to refer them for treatment. And they also have to understand that treatment works. Next slide. So these are the women that we serve, and we got to hear some voices of recovery in our first panel. Let me share with you the kind of a composite of the women that I serve. Almost all of the women that come to us have come to us because they are pregnant and they've been identified through child protective services, or they come through drug court, or a family member calls on their behalf, or we get a provider that says, help me, I've got this woman, she's pregnant, I don't know what to do. And then we have the desperate women who are calling every single day. And if I could bring my case manager here to talk about that, she would say that the pain and suffering that she hears, she gets 25 to 30 calls a day, and we only have 16 beds in one unit for residential treatment, eight beds in another, and we desperately need more opportunity and more resources to serve women. 
Um, most of our women do not have jobs. They do not have transportation. They don't have a driver's license. They have not been in, in the workforce. They've dropped out of high school, often because they've gotten pregnant. Almost all of our women that have come through have been physically, sexually, and emotionally abused. And if there's one policy thing that I really want to advocate for is that we need to, as a nation, take childhood sexual abuse seriously, get it out into the light, shine light into it, and get really good prevention. Because so many of our women, that's where the pain and the suffering started from with their substance, with, before they went to their substance use disorder. Um, uh, many of our women have been told by their parents that their body is their pocketbook and the only thing you're good for is selling your body. That's the only way you're going to make money. Um, and we are also have higher rates of women who are coming in that are testing opioid positive. It used to be when Horizon started in 1993 that they were all cocaine use disordered women. Now a third of our women are prescription opioid using and where they started, they started getting it from their doctors, from their medicine cabinets in their homes or their family members, and a few of them buying it off the street. Next slide, please. So because there is this intersection of no employment, a lack of education, really high rates of physical, emotional, um, and sexual trauma, we have to have a complex treatment to treat these complex women. Um, we can't, it is an unrealistic expectation to think that if we treat somebody for 12 weeks, they're magically going to get better. It took years for the addiction to get to this point. It's going to take equally years to help our women be in full recovery. So we provide trauma-informed care. We actually use a lot of Stephanie Covington's work as well as Lisa Najavitz. Um, and that's intertwined trauma and addiction treatment. We provide child care. We're, we are one of those programs because thank you to the state of North Carolina and allocating their block grant funding appropriately to help us have child care. Um, that's fantastic. We have a maternal child therapist on site we fund that position on a grant. Um, it's a grant, the Orange County Partnership for Children, because we don't have any other resources to do that. We do provide opioid medications for our women who are opioid dependent and need them. Um, so we use uh, buprenorphine as our main modality of treatment. We also very much um, applaud the use of methadone when it's used in appropriate doses, just like buprenorphine. We have a big rehabilitation component because our premise is you need to first become abstinent from drugs, you need a safe place to live, and you need to get gainful employment or fulfilling volunteerism or get your GED that's going to lead to your future job, your, your now job, and then your future job. Uh, we also are unique in the fact that we have an OBGYN center um, where, we, where women can go and they can receive their OBGYN care. Um, and we also have a nurse on staff to provide that low-level medical care that our women and our children so desperately need. Next slide. So this slide is to tell you that treatment for pregnant and parenting women works, but it works not in a vacuum. It works by a whole group of community people coming together to help build community around our women. Um, so what this slide shows you, these are um, outcomes from our women who are pregnant and went, went through our Horizons treatment. Um, and what you can see is that in the 1.5 prematurity rate, so if you're a woman who has a baby at Horizons, you have one, only 1.5% of our babies are born premature. And that's actually better than the state average of North Carolina, and it's much better than the average of non-treated um, pregnant women. In terms of low birth weight, our babies also look better than the state average and um, another sample of untreated women. So this shows you treatment works for pregnant women in terms of birth outcomes. The other really good success story that we have is about child protective services. So women that complete our residential treatment, which is up to one year that they get to live with us and have all of the services that you saw on that previous slide, Every single woman that went through our residential treatment program and completed had a positive child protective service outcome. That means we are reuniting children and moms together. We are getting cases closed. 
Um, and for our outpatient women, because we have a burgeoning outpatient program, because we don't have the beds to be able to take all, all of our women into residential treatment, nor do all of our women need that high level of care, of those women that completed the program, 75% of our women, three out of four women, had their cases closed, positive outcomes, children reunited with moms. So we are doing our small part in the state of North Carolina to bring our mothers back um, into full recovery. Next slide, please. I needed to put these data in because um, these were data that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a randomized controlled trial comparing methadone and buprenorphine during pregnancy. And what we found was that for both medications, regardless of methadone or buprenorphine, for mothers, the outcomes were very similar. They, both of these medications, when they're given as a part of comprehensive care and inappropriate doses, it helps maintain drug abstinence in our women, helps give them the foundation to put their lives back together. For our babies, we did have two statistically significant outcomes where our buprenorphine-exposed babies required less medication to treat their neonatal abstinence syndrome. They stayed in the hospital a shorter period of time. Um, but the important thing is, what this study shows, is that we have two medications to treat opioid dependence during pregnancy, not just one anymore. So it gives options. Next slide. So what are my policy recommendations? Um, so I asked my women before I came here, because I said I had this opportunity, and they were like, what? You mean the Senate really cares about this? They couldn't believe it. They were blown away that all of these people would actually come together to talk about them, and in a helpful way, and not a punitive way. So number one from them is, could we please change the language of addiction? So much of what we use is so incredibly punitive. What's the opposite of a clean urine? A dirty urine, right? It's incredibly stigmatizing. Using addict as a noun is really stigmatizing. Can we please, if it, since it is an illness, a medically understood illness, can we please use medical language to appropriately talk about our disease? Um, secondly, they said, you gotta tell them we're really good at manipulating doctors. Um, and I think that that is something, I mean, our women have grown up, they talk about going with their parents and actually being taught how to talk to the doctor to manipulate them to get the drug that they want, the drug that makes them feel good. So that goes with um, the policy about mandating education. We need to educate all types of providers that come into contact with our women, law enforcement, Dentist, how many dentists give out 30 or 40 Vicodin at any one time for tooth pain? We need to understand not just about misuse of prescription opioids, but about addiction and about addiction treatment and what are the principles of addiction treatment that work. Every single provider needs to, and healthcare and judicial person needs to know about that. Um, the other thing they wanted me to say is that tell them, Andre, you know what your program does, what Horizon just does, it gives us, when we walk in, we have a pocket full of pills. When we walk out, we have a pocket full of skills. And thank you, Horizons, for letting us use those. Um, so, and, so that's from them. Um, in terms of advocacy, absolutely, we need help with payment reform. Um, what the uh, previous panel has already talked about, I just want to underscore, we need patient-centered care. We're all talking about patient-centered care. The payment system has to be patient-centered too. I'm really tired of having eight hard visits you know, that I have to meet in a certain period of time. Our women, with the way their life is, it is almost impossible. You're setting the bar way too hard, high and you're setting them up to fail. So please, can we move to looking at dose of treatment rather than number of um, days in treatment Treatment or number of hard sessions. Um, housing. When our women leave our program, we have nurtured them and supported them for a full year. Where do they go? Many of our women have no other housing options and they have to go back home. And the chances that they have a job and that they have a safe place to live are really, really low. The women that have success are those that have that aftercare housing. We definitely need a greater continuum of options from the federal level to be able to have adequate housing options for our women. Not necessarily just permanent, but transient too. Um, and what else did I wanna say? Oh, and then I think the last thing I'm gonna say, and then I'll stop, is in our policy, we need to talk about gender. If you look at most of the policies in the United States right now about drug treatment and the drug approach, drug enforcement, where's gender? Where is gender in it? 
We have to, you know, if, if it's just, when it's neutral, women get ignored, children get ignored. So I would challenge everybody to let's look at our policies again and let's take an eye to look with gender. And with that, I will thank you. I hope we have time for questions and discussion because that sounds like a fantastic program. And, um, you know, we're, it sounds like we're going to hear a lot about what can be done and done well and what gets in the way of what can be done and done well. Um, Margot Spence is here as president and CEO of First Step Home in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I've heard fantastic things about this program, so I'm very eager. Thank you, Tracy. <clears throat> Good morning. I am Margo Spence, the president and CEO of First Step Home. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the forum. This is absolutely outstanding. And I know Senator Portman is no longer here, but I would especially like to thank him for the outstanding work he's done in Ohio. For years, he's been very supportive of the substance abuse field in the area, particularly of prevention. Thank you for the honor of allowing me to speak with you today about First Step Home and our integrated care for pregnant opiate addicted moms program. We are located in Cincinnati, Ohio, and we serve women and women with children, mostly from Hamilton County, but throughout the state of Ohio. All of our homes are located within several blocks and therefore we're able to provide a campus environment for mom and her children. We provide trauma-informed, non-judgmental, residential, outpatient, and transitional housing. In addition, we have a daycare on site for the children of the moms in treatment. By breaking the cycle of addiction, it is support for the entire family, for the entire community. Our focus is on individual care and respecting the goals of each woman that comes through our doors. As we look at our statistics over the past two years, it is evident our clients are getting younger more are pregnant and without prenatal care. In addition, they are using opiates at a much younger age. In 2013, the average age of our client was 28 years of age, 63% opiate addicted at entry, 33% were pregnant, 76% of our clients were Caucasian, 22% were African American, 32% no prenatal care, age at first opiate use was 28, and the number of clients we had was 287 throughout the year. For 2014, the average age of our client, 26.6. 79% are opiate addicted at entry. 45% are pregnant. 88% are Caucasian. 11% African American. 36% no prenatal care upon entry. Age at first use of opiates, 23. The number of clients that we served during the fiscal year 2014, 326 clients. In order to give you an idea of the type of client that comes through our doors and the services that she receives, I'd like to just share with you a quote from one of our clients. This is Lauren's story. When I first walked into First Step Home, I didn't know if I was ready for this type of environment. It was much bigger than the other program that I had attended, but I began to let my guard down. 
Everyone was caring and inviting. I learned to work with others while helping with meals and chores. The everyday things like cleaning my room and taking on responsibilities made me feel important and part of something bigger than myself. As I moved to First Step Home Housing, I became excited about becoming a clean mother and caretaker for my family. I was able to work independently and look for a job. I was able to help other new moms deal with their addiction by sharing my life story. First Step Home has impacted my life dramatically. I had lost everything due to my addiction. With the help of First Step Home, I was able to get a job and find a home for my children. I continue to be sober and clean. First Step Home gave me the chance of a lifetime. They never gave up on me. That's something I never had before. I am so grateful for the new life I have been given due to their care and love." End of quote. In order to understand how we arrived at our integrated program for pregnant opiate addicted women, I would like to share just a short overview of our history. Our program began in 1993 as a drug and alcohol treatment program for women and women with children. Our founders answered the community need of a program that would allow women to bring their children up to the age of 12 with them into treatment. At that time, we treated only alcoholism, addiction to crack cocaine, and marijuana. Since 1993, we have added mental health services and other components to address the needs of women and women with children. Today, we continue to be the only certified treatment program that allows moms to bring their children up to the age of 12 into treatment with them in Hamilton County. Over the past few years, we've experienced a tremendous increase in the number of pregnant opiate addicted moms in our program needing residential care and needing safe, sober housing upon the completion of the program. As our numbers have increased of pregnant clients, we began to experience early dropout treatment rates for the moms, low birth rates of the infants, and long stays of infants in neonatal units. In order to enhance our outcomes and ultimately to provide better services for the mothers and also for the babies, we, re we research more effective treatment modalities and began to meet with treatment providers in the community to coordinate services and to provide more services on site for our clients rather than having them go from one agency <clears throat> to the other. This really involved a lot of communication, enhanced communications with a lot of the providers because we really felt in order to, for the client to get well and for the children to be healthy, that it was up to us as providers to work together to create a seamless system of care for our clients. With an, this was a total emphasis on best practice care. Many of our clients receive medicated assisted therapy. They have the option to take methadone, suboxone, or subutex along with the counseling therapy. And I think the most important part there it's an option for that client. The client and her doctor, we take the direction 
from that rather than, than having a, a general rule that our clients can't take this drug or that drug. We have seen tremendous outcomes with our MAT system, which is the medicated assisted therapy for the pregnant moms. And I'd like to just share some of the outcomes. Prior to MAT, the average NIC stay, NICU stay for the baby was 18.6 days. 63% of the babies born were under the five pound, eight ounces standard. Length of stay in treatment was 31 days for the mom, and relapse rate was 62%. With MAT, the average stay for the baby is currently 3.7 days. 97.5% of the babies born to Subutex moms were at proper birth rates. The length of stay for the moms in treatment was 74 days, and the relapse rate for these moms was reduced to 39%. In March of this year, as a result of a grant that we received through the state, we have added a medical director to our services, additional case management services, voc ed services, and child care treatment support. We partner with a hospital, the Good Sam Hospital, for uh, coordinated services, as well as five other agencies in Hamilton County. <clears throat> Excuse me. For most of the moms we see, a full continuum of care is essential for recovery. Residential care, transitional housing, outpatient services are just a few of the components needed, supported by professional staff as well as peer mentors, recovery coaches for a mom, and the children to successfully reintegrate into the community. Our goal is to help women and moms recover from addiction, deliver healthy babies, and stabilize their families and become contributing members of our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margot Spence. Um, I was struck by the, uh, your original mandate and how you've evolved to respond to changes. And um, we are in a state of emergency in terms of the prescription painkiller, opiate, and heroin crisis, but it's not a new emergency of addiction. We've been here before. And um, it's, we have an opportunity to respond with evidence-based practice, what works, the critical voice of people directly affected instead of hysteria that caused us to create an emergency of crack babies and so forth. So I'm just very conscious that we are standing on the shoulders of a lot of work that was done before and we are creating better pathways as we move forward. I'm really happy to introduce the next person because I know her well. Um, Georgia Lerner is the um, executive director of the Women's Prison Association, um, a long-standing program in New York and in the country. Women's Prison Association was probably one of the earliest treatment programs because that's where you put crazy and addicted women back in the day. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and uh, Georgia and I have worked together for quite some time on educating New York policymakers about the benefits and wisdom of alternative to incarceration programs and effective reentry programs, but particularly for women because it seems that the criminal justice system defaults to the male gender, as does addiction services, defaults to male. And, and things are, that's not right, it doesn't work. And women do have particular and unique needs. And Georgia's gonna talk about an innovative program that WPA is undertaking now 
that I think is um, very instructional, very hopeful. Thank you. I'm honored to be here and thank you for the opportunity to address you. I'm excited not only because it really is a privilege to be here, but also because I have good news to report about something that is working and it allows mothers to stay with their children in their own homes, and it's much cheaper than prison. And I will start just with this sort of blanket statement because we are not an addiction treatment program. We work with women who have some involvement with the criminal justice system, but almost all of the women who arrive at the door of WPA, or the Women's Prison Association, get there through drug use. So whether they have a diagnosis of addiction or not, drug use or alcohol use is usually the way that women come to us. So as Tracy said, I'm executive director of the Women's Prison Association. We were founded in 1845 to help women create better lives after incarceration and to improve the conditions of their confinement. And today our work includes working with women at all stages of involvement of the criminal justice continuum including prevention, which I think is most exciting because I'd love to put ourselves out of business one day. So uh, for many years, WPA has been sought out by women because we were there for them when they needed to address multiple issues simultaneously. Although our human services systems are generally set up to meet one need, housing or addiction or health care or mental health, nobody experiences, experiences these needs in a vacuum. We've often heard from women that they left or failed residential drug treatment, and that was pretty much the default alternative to our incarceration option for any woman or man in New York and many places who was arrested on a drug charge and getting an alternative. But we've heard from many women that they left or failed treatment because they did not want to wait until they had established a strong enough track record of sobriety before they could start planning to see their children. And with the advent of the Adoption, Adoption and Safe Families Act, women, especially if they had also spent time in prison, ran the real risk of losing custody of their children if they didn't maintain regular contact while their children were in foster care. So women are right in wanting to manage multiple needs at once, but our systems are generally not accommodating. And our clients can count on us to help them address whatever needs they identify which usually include family law issues, health care, sobriety support, mental health care, housing, employment, and legal sources of income, compliance with criminal justice mandates, the list goes on. And after those nuts and bolts are worked out, we think it's important to help them figure out how to use their leisure time constructively. In the course of our work, we've heard firsthand from clients about their experiences of poverty, trauma, domestic violence, poor educational achievement, and the list of issues that my colleagues have and will discuss today. It became clear to me as I spent more time in jails and prisons, at our former residential alternative to incarceration program, and with women who had been locked up, that we know too much to continue using the same models for responding to crime. I like to start with the question, why do we respond to crime? I think the answer is obvious. It's to maintain public safety and order, right? Isn't that the reason? So what should flow from that is that our responses to unlawful behavior should be designed to restore and maintain public safety and order. But we have seen that prisons and jails are only moderately effective at promoting public safety, and that is limited to removing dangerous actors from the community. We have seen in some neighborhoods that if we remove too many people, even if we think we're just removing the bad actors, crime actually does not decrease. So the idea that we can take the criminals away and make the neighborhood safer is a solution on which we should not rely if our goal is to promote public safety. It seemed to me, from what I saw when we used the opportunities in our residential ATI, to learn from everyday situations, like taking a subway, going to the store, sharing a bedroom, that real life is the best classroom for people to practice pro-social adaptive behaviors and emotional self-regulation. One might say that I am a fanatic believer, and I'm sure my staff say that I'm a fanatic about many things, mm -hmm. but that I am a fanatic believer in the instructive value of real life. I insist that WPA staff see where their clients live so that they can understand the view from the client's perspective. 
Knowing what the world really looks like through a client's window provides essential information for assisting clients in articulating goals, needs, and provides the right environment for us to model and encourage behaviors that promote their successful achievement. Seeing where clients live can also provide a wealth of information about strengths that women may not recognize. Sure, women recognize their problems and see if there are issues with the physical environment, but they often need another set of eyes and significant encouragement to see and use the resources that are nearby. So here's the good news. It's called Justice Home. It's this a program that WPA implemented that uses evidence-based practice and it's consistent with our organizational mi mission and values to divert women from incarceration and promote public safety by addressing root causes of crime. The program is cheaper than incarceration. It prevents disruption of families and it prevents homelessness. It allows women to stay with their children in the community and it avoids the reentry process entirely and it promotes public safety by reducing the chances that an individual will commit an additional crime. We've just completed the first year of programming, but it is based on a model that has been used for foster care prevention, and we used that model, we had operated that model for more than 10 years before we adapted and added to it to make it a criminal justice program. And the first thing we did was use a validated gender-specific risk and needs assessment to identify the criminogenic risks for women facing felony charges and at least six months of incarceration. If a woman is interested in addressing her criminogenic risks, the things that are contributing to her criminal behavior, and they are risks that could be constructively addressed in the community. So if they are things like mental illness, healthcare needs, parental stress, unsafe housing, things that we can deal with in the community setting, and she's interested in addressing those things, we will go to the judge and the prosecutor and defense and the whole team and advocate for her to come to our program instead of prison. So far, prosecutors are requiring that women plead guilty, usually to a lesser charge, in order to enter the program, and then the charge is dismissed when a woman completes the program successfully. But we'll come back to that. Uh, during her sentence in Justice Home, a woman works on achieving individual goals. She gets regular visits from our staff, probably more regular than she wants. We do drug testing. Staff um, and the client make periodic pro visits to court and do written and in-person you know, visits before the judge. Staff visits decrease as clients become more stable, but they vary depending on a client's situation and needs. And staff meet with clients in the community to help improve client familiarity and comfort in a range of aspects of community life. It's one thing to tell somebody that there's a public library and it's free, but going to the public library with someone and walking with someone and helping someone become comfortable and competent in these settings is critical if somebody's going to be able to manage it long term. In addition to the individual service plan goals, clients participate in an evidence-based group intervention for women that takes into account relational theory, women's pathways, and includes cognitive behavioral restructuring, socialization, and other features. The women love this. We weren't sure that they would want to come into the office to participate, and they love it, and they want more and more. Client progress actually can be measured in a kind of, in a scientific way. I don't have to say kind of scientific, it can be measured scientifically. We look at, we re-administer the risk and needs assessment after a client's participation over time and can see that criminogenic risks are decreasing. So we know that this intervention is working. We also see that clients are achieving goals that are important to them. And the kinds of goals that clients have, I mean, every person has individual goals, but the kinds of things, so you get an idea, are having a certain period of sobriety, getting and keeping a job for a period of time, possibly having their employment situation improve, uh, achieving educational uh, goals, improving child protective factors in the household, relocating to safer house housing, things like that. All of the women who have been engaged in the program for six months showed significant reduction in risks from medium or high risk in areas to low, and none of our program participants has been arrested. The concept is simple. When we identify the root causes of criminal involvement, we probably have the best tools for dealing with those causes in the community. And if we can address the root causes, we can reduce the chances that the individual commit future crimes. We can promote public safety by eliminating the drivers of crime one woman at a time. 
Now, I know this forum is about addiction, and I have been surprised and fascinated to learn in my years at WPA that addiction is not usually the primary reason that a woman commits crime. Drugs are almost always involved, but antisocial associates, parental stress, active psychosis and other mental illness, prior trauma, abuse in childhood, and as an adult, economic and educational deficits, housing safety, poor self-efficacy, and lack of family support almost always emerge as higher risk factors than addiction when we do the risk and needs assessment. So these are all, this is all part of what you're hearing about today, but addiction used to be the, addiction treatment used to be the only thing that we were offering as an alternative to prison. When women have children, parental stress is commonly present, and our home-based program offers an unparalleled opportunity to make a positive difference for the mother and for her children. When we partner with Mothers of Young Children in Justice Home, we can assess and address child safety, developmental milestones, maternal stress, and we can model and reinforce constructive parenting behaviors and promote early childhood and family literacy. Clearly, when a woman goes to prison, we are not able to assist her in managing her household, parenting, and community responsibilities. The skills that a woman can develop in prison cannot be compared to the skills that she can develop, implement, and refine within the actual context of her family's life in the community. So based on what we've learned, I have a couple recommendations. One, we need to expand these home -based evidence, this home-based, evidence-based model to more communities. You can make almost anything work in New York City. We have a great public transportation system. We have lots of treatment beds. We have a lot of alternatives. But this individualized option that's based on the assessed risk and needs of the, of the person who we're dealing with can be taken to a rural environment. It can be taken anywhere. And the other thing I'm pushing for is that we really push to have deferrals of prosecution and not require that everybody take a guilty plea before they're allowed to go into a program because those convictions, even though they're supposed to be, they're supposed to be dismissed, have a, a nasty way of sticking around and having collateral consequences forever and ever. Thank you. Okay, wait. I got the hurry up sign, but I don't want you to Squimp, no pressure at all. We, uh, I've been taught every policy issue, no matter how honorable, is connected to money. And um, we have an opportunity to hear about some innovative strategies for financing, which certainly have come up. So thank you, Pam, for your wisdom. Well, I'm very glad to have this opportunity, and um, I do have slides, but I think I'm not going to use them just for in um, light of the time crunch here. But I will have to let you know that um, at CareSource, I'm going to give you just a real uh, brief overview of what Care CareSource is a uh, large Medicaid health plan in Ohio, and we also have operations as of last year in Kentucky. Um, we have been around, we celebrated our 25th anniversary this year, um, same CEO, same founder, so it's really exciting. We're a nonprofit health plan. To give you a, a sense of our size and who we serve, um, we have uh, 1.2 million members that we um, take and provide care coordination for and, and cover all kinds of very innovative type programs. Um, you know, our mission is really, you know, we really do care about what we do. Um, each and every day. And um, the, the lion's share of our membership is um, covered family children. That's approximately um, 950,000 of our membership. And 100,000 plus our, our age blind and disabled membership. We just launched May 1st our uh, duals demonstration, our Medicaid, Medicare. And I'm still standing here. <laughs> uh, Let's just say it was a very complex implementation. We'll just leave it at that. Um, but very excited for that. And um, we do have a small special needs plan. And as I said, our operations in Kentucky. I've been with CareSource. I am a clinician. I'm a nurse um, and have been practicing uh, over 32 years. And um, on the direct care side in home health, hospice, behavioral health, and you know, switched to the payer side um, about 10 years ago, and, you know, I'm very happy that I did that to be able to impact, um, you know, some innovative payments models. 
Um, with that, though, um, when I joined CareSource almost seven years ago, I, fir I was introduced um, to our what we call our special investigative unit. And uh, initially, um, I was a little scared of the people that worked in that unit. They uh, were very much uh, focused on uh, law enforcement and some carried guns. I thought that was interesting, but um, yeah, the, there was one nurse on the team, and she was, you know, when I first came to CareSource, she looked at me and said, it was almost like, please get me out of here. So my job is all around clinical design and development of all the health services programs, quality accreditation, all of the clinical, behavioral, physical, all the programs, all the care and clinical programs. So I could see that um, I think our special investigative unit didn't really you know, they saw all these patterns, you know, pharmacies, different pharmacies, different providers, all of these patterns, you know, looking at the drugs that were being prescribed and over 30,000 providers, you know, all kinds of interesting things that providers were doing as well that we were uncovering. Um, pharmacies, uh, you know, medications not being billed, some were being billed. So it was truly something that needed to be sorted out. And um, so with that, I um, had this nurse who was extremely competent and very skilled um, in the area of case management, um, substance use, uh, behavioral health. And I said, you just come on over to the clinical side. And nobody really knew where to have her report. So I actually had a report directly um, into me. And at that time, um, we moved the clinical team and the operations um, over uh, to us, um, we have a very, very large case management program. Um, we are required by the state of Ohio. We have very rigorous requirements around case management, so we have um, a very high-touch, community-based, boots-on-the-ground case management program for both physical and behavioral health. Um, so this fit perfectly. You know, her focus and her emphasis was great. So what happened is we, we created a program that was called Care For You. And with that, um, the state had a re very, um, very uh, kind of a weak requirement for, uh, they called it um, member management for substance abuse. And we knew that we had to have some type of emphasis on this, but there were no official guidelines, no lock-in, there was nothing that we were required to do. So we just decided to dive in and we created the program ourselves. Um, we had to ask for some staff. You know, our finance uh, staff was at our doorstep wondering what we, were, what we were doing because it was very outside of what the normal traditional health plan would be doing. Um, so we did create the Care For You team uh, over about six years ago, and it's a multidisciplinary team that has pharmacy, nurses. Um, we work with uh, within 88 counties in Ohio out there working with all the providers, the community mental health centers, the federally qualified health centers, um, all of any kind of community pr provider that we call health partners. And, with that, um, we manage in all of the membership that we identify um, through our reports and informatics and direct referrals for those members that we know have um, significant um, issues with substance use, um, behavioral health. Um, we have a fully integrated model, so it's within um, our care management program. Um, we now have uh, that program within a much more structured lock-in program that the state has now mandated for all Medicaid health plans. So that has evolved into that. So um, we're very, very happy um, about that. So um, the Care for You program has, has done remarkable work. We had a lot of skeptics up front. You know, everyone said, well, it, it's just never going to work. And I'm not quite sure in a health plan setting how you are going to engage you know, the members and, and how are you going to work with all these different providers and how is it going to be paid. So um, you know, we proved all of them wrong. And um, some of the slides that I have, I will give kudos to our interns in our in informatics department. They came to me with the slides and said, which I'm happy to share, but 
they worked on the slides for me, and um, I have highlights from those um, very high level, but um, they were very cute. They said, so how are the slides? And I said, they're perfect. I wouldn't change a thing. So they exist um, the way they are. The interns did a wonderful job. So first of all, I want to say that just in Ohio, I think we've heard some of the, the key statistics, but you know, in 2013, um, you know, there was a significant number of um, children that we know, children and, and, and individuals 12 and older, you know, that have um, 285,000 were identified that year that, you know, have a substance um, a use um, a diagnosis. At CareSource, um, we pulled our data in 2013, and we have approximately 16 to 20,000 individuals, 12 and older, um, that were assigned um, what we call our drug abuse diagnosis. So pretty significant number. Um, and 62% of that number um, were female. Um, and they, they actually fell uh, in the range of 18 to 39. Um, over 50% of those that were diagnosed were in treatment, which is great. Um, they weren't using uh, opiates and other than the methadone and Suboxone. So they were in treatment and you know we work day in and day out to make sure that we try to get them um, coordinated within all the, the communities in Ohio. Uh, our informatics team pulled some um, information around what were the comorbid other conditions? Because, you know, we weren't sure with that large number, you know, what were the top physical conditions that were presenting? You know, when you think of covered family children and you think of the age blind and disabled, no surprise that the top diagnosis was low back pain and hypertension and asthma, which I thought was really, really interesting. The top behavioral health diagnosis, diagnoses in our population was, was anxiety and depression. And um, one thing that we have learned, um, and we are always learning, you know, every year that we're out there case managing and, and trying to make sure that we're touching the appropriate members. This year, our informatics team um, decided to look at um, our data with our one million members, which is certainly a daunting task of how do you know and what to do for the membership and what do we authorize? You know, obviously we have to um, approve services and we case manage and, and the payment alike. So with that, they did some cluster analysis across our population and it certainly solidified the need for payment of additional services out there. Um, for us to just continue to advocate for changing those programs. Um, we had nine personas that we came up with, and across all of the personas, it was interesting that there, the diagnosis of depression and anxiety were in every persona, um, you know, the, that, was, that was rampant. So if those are the top uh, behavioral health diagnoses, then you know other uh, potential um, substance use uh, issues are there. In addition to that, um, there was one persona of uncoordinated care, and that was, I of course have them all ingrained in my brain now, but it was persona six, and it was, um, it was called uncoordinated care. And there were 54,000 people in that bucket that were just getting care, all haphazard, lots of opiate use, lots of, so, you know, it was pretty clear, and, it, and we're working on it right now to really re-engineer how we're looking at who we're actually touching out there in the community. So we are always looking at the complex, high risk, you know, very chronically ill, and we put all these services, and certainly there's quite a few of our um, consumers that are in that category that have substance use, but we're not focusing on the uncoordinated care. Um, as much as the high chronic complex. In addition, the children in some of the other personas and with severe mental illness um, and all of the other problems. So now we're, we're just stepping back and looking at that um, from a different perspective to put the services there. Um, one thing the informatics team did pull out was that um, opiates and drug use um, and a drug uh, use diagnosis um, 
it was there was three uh, over three times um, higher cost than those that had non opiate use. We also um, found that neonatal alcohol syndrome. This was in 2013. The cost was 18.5 times more than just a typical newborn, and that was um, approximately 500 cases that were looked at. Um, and this is really, uh, I have to talk about infant mortality, and I know that everyone in Ohio, um, you know, our infant mortality rates are, are, you know, terrible, and we have many initiatives out there. I think we're, I think, 49 out of 50 um, in the states. Um, there was definitely higher infant mortality um, rates for members using substances um, within 12 months of delivery. In fact, the infant mortality rate, um, the, it was the, the, the rate for substance use was 14.7 per thousand as opposed to 9.7 per 1,000 of no substance use. So there's definitely a link there as we know. The good news is that all of the members that have gone through the Care For You program, and I will tell you that, um, I'll give you this bit of advice from the health plan side and case management side, and that is that I know I can get, as a case manager, I can get anything covered as long as I can justify the medical necessity, show that there are, um, you know, show the research, show the guideline, and show the cost benefit analysis. So with that, um, I'm able to get it covered. So I always say, let's place these members in case management and get the services um, authorized. Um, and with Care For You and those members that have been in the program, we have, over the years, we've seen a total per member per month cost reduction um, by 28% which is about $651 per member per month, which is significant. We have also seen emergency department and inpatient claims decrease by 44% and 32% respectively. And all of those members that have graduated from the Care For You program, um, their cost and their appropriate utilization and care has continued in their second and third year um, in the program. So it has been sustained. Um, the, the, in, in just in closing, our la last few comments, I did have a uh, maternal child uh, slide, and in that particular population, you know, it's a full court press on what we offer all the way, uh, you know, all th through the antepartum stages of, of really um, high intense touch. Um, and then just uh, one of the last slides that the interns pulled was that you know, we definitely um, have seen some changes uh, up and down as we've had our pharmacy benefit carved in and carved out and carved back in. Um, it definitely impacts the opiate use uh, trend. And, and um, when the benefit is carved in and we were, we're managing it, uh, we see a very nice trend and appropriate use and intervention with the membership. Um, so I did also want to uh, just make mention to that. And that's, those are my comments for today. Thank you. Okay. Um, we are moving along in our time. We, you promised to make the slides available, so we're going to figure out how to get those. Okay. Um, I guess we are now at our question and answer. Whoa. Okay. Um, so, a note. especially for those of you with multiple part questions, because um, I'm going to need to repeat the question into the microphone. So, the lady in the back. So, the question generally has to do with barriers to medication assisted treatment for women um, pregnant and parenting particularly as they interface with the criminal justice system, drug courts. So if anyone wants to speak to that, if you could touch your mic so the red light is on so it can get recorded. So thank you for that question. Um, so I, I do, 
do want to say that um, the National um, Association for Drug Court Professionals does have an active education campaign. I actually was a part of their most recent conference. So I think that there's, and from that three hour discussion, there was a lot of interest and thought. So I think that there is, I think that the, the conversations are starting to happen. They absolutely need to happen more. I, I honestly think that the best way to kind of change the, the generation is to get addiction treatment education into law schools. Because that if you learn about the treatment and that treatment works and the principles of treatment and that medications are an appropriate part, I think you're gonna see the, the culture change. That's my short answer. Excellent question, because I believe we do experience this in many of our communities, and education, education, education is really the answer. It's kind of hard to argue with good results, so I think when those results can be shared with the different components that you mentioned, I think that uh, we're on the road to more effective treatment for our clients. Okay, so the question was for Legal Action Center? And my colleagues in here, and I can um, safely say that that is a particular area of interest for us. We have certainly been happy to work with our colleagues at um, National Association of Pregnant Women and um, National Advocates for Pregnant Women. Sorry, don't throw a shoe at me. And um, medication-assisted treatment, particularly the um, some of the barriers to it in the criminal justice system, is a particular focus for us. We do. Um, we are actively working on developing um, a roadmap that addresses broader addiction issues, but particularly those barriers, and specifically around MAT um, as it is um, greeted with some hostility by both Child Protective Services and by the criminal justice system. So that is something that we are actively working on, obviously with ACA and as part of essential health benefits, and also around parity issues, it's become critically important to um, kind of put out a statement and also work with states in terms of how they're able to um, incorporate those policies into their state's approach. So there's not a federal response per se, but working state by state is what we're hoping to be most helpful with. I think I'm supposed to cut it off at, I'm supposed to cut it off. <laughs> so yes, one more or stop, stop. Thank you so much, and thank you to the panelists. I'm Linda Rosenberg, and I'm president and CEO of the National Council for Behavioral Health. We're an association of over 2,200 organizations that provide mental health and substance use treatments. And I'm pleased and proud to add our voice to the voices this morning and the growing voices that are recognizing addiction as a public health crisis that we are in the midst of. What I'm going to do is not go on any further. I want to begin to introduce, and I want it myself here from our panelists. I'm going to, I've abbreviated their biographies because I thought it was more important that you hear from them than um, hear from me reading what they've all accomplished. Um, Dr. Stephanie Covington is a clinician, author, organizational consultant, and lecturer recognized for her pioneering work in the area of women's issues dr covington specializes in the development and implementation of gender responsive and trauma informed services in both the public and private sector she's published extensively and serves on the faculty of several universities based in california she is co-director of both the institute for relational development and the center for gender and justice stephanie Um, thank you for still being here, and thanks to the organizers. Um, and I'm going to be talking about, particularly about addiction and trauma in women's lives. Oh, I keep forgetting this doesn't work, but I'll use it as a point. Next slide. Um, this actually is Chris Gorella's slide that she loaned me a number of years ago, looking at the evolution of women's treatment. And, you know, I've been in the field a very long time. Just people were talking about how... Uh, 
in the 80s, we used to have more time for women, a year-long program and so forth. Well, at the end of the 70s in Washington, D.C., there was an office called Women in Alcoholism that was funded, and they had 12 demonstration projects at the end of the 70s. That's about the same number we still have now in 2014. Do I need to say more? Um, and you'll notice that in the ev evolution of treatment, no, I, oops, this worked. Oh, that's really funny. I don't know, go back, thanks. Evolution of treatment, we began to talk about being gender responsive, and here's trauma-informed. And let me just define what I think that really means. Gender responsive, the definition I use, it means creating an environment by thinking about your site selection. Next slide. Uh, about your staff, who you're going to have work there, how you're going to actually develop the program, the content and material, and all of that needs to reflect an understanding of the lives of women. And you cannot be gender responsive, I believe, unless you're trauma-informed. Next slide. Because without understanding trauma, you can't understand women's lives, regardless of where they show up in any of our social services. And being trauma-informed means how you do business. It means you understand trauma and you adjust what you're doing in order for the trauma survivor to be able to benefit from whatever service you're providing. And my best example of this is going to be my dentist, because this example will stay with you. A couple of years ago, my dentist says, Stephanie, I think myself, our staff, we need to understand trauma. And this is how she practices dentistry today. She has television sets in the ceiling with headphones so people can watch TV or they can listen to music. Everyone is told, coming into her practice, if you feel agitated or feel any anxiety and want to get up and walk around, just let us know. Did you ever know you could get out of the dental chair? <laughs> she has people do a breathing exercise before the heavy plate is put on their chest for x-rays. She had the wisdom to understand that the dental office was filled with triggers, sight, sound, smells in that environment, that when a trauma survivor experiences them, it pushes them back in time so they're flooded by the feelings from that traumatic event. If my dentist can become trauma-informed, what is keeping mental health providers and addiction treatment providers from becoming trauma-informed? <clears throat> I've been in this field long enough to tell you <clears throat> that the mantra in addiction, we have known for over 30 years that women who have addictive disorders have histories of trauma. It is not new information. But the mantra has been in the addiction field that a woman needs to be clean and sober for a year before she can deal with her trauma. We have kept women from having sustained recovery because of our inability to look at this issue. Next slide. And they're basically five core principles or values that need to be incorporated into this environment, this gender responsive environment that's trauma informed. Safety, trustworthiness, choice, collaboration, and empowerment. While these are the same core values for men and women, safety, for example, is different for men and women. They experience it differently and they need different things in place. And so what it really means when you become trauma-informed, it's a change in the culture of the program. It's a culture shift, and it involves everyone, not just treatment providers. Everybody working in the program, the person who's the receptionist, the person in the billing department, the person who's driving the van, everybody. So it's a huge change in how we provide services. So one definition of trauma is it's an external event that overwhelms a person's, it's an overwhelming experience. It, it really overwhelms someone's ability to cope. Next slide. And trauma can be a single event or it can be ongoing. So for some women, it's a single event, but for most of them, it's been some kind of ongoing trauma, ongoing trauma. Next slide. And we know that trauma, the stress of adversity, is toxic to the development of the brain. As we've learned more from brain research about addiction, we've learned more from the brain research about the impact of trauma. Particularly important when you think about children because of the development of the brain. And so there's some primary responses or some primary areas that are impacted. One, feelings, emotions. 
There's dysregulation. People can't manage. A woman can't manage her feelings. Behavior becomes unmanageable, and there's difficulty with relationships. And what's a good solution to these problems? Using alcohol and other drugs. So for many women, they begin to use alcohol and other drugs as a solution, and then the solution becomes the problem. And so as we're understanding trauma, which is really about violence in people's lives, we begin to see its centrality in our society. Violence and trauma increase imprisonment, and incarceration increases violence and trauma. It increases homelessness, homelessness increases violence and trauma. It increases addiction, and addiction increases violence and trauma. And it increases mental health problems. So when we begin to talk about trauma, there are also gender differences. What are some of those differences? And I'm going to be talking about this as men and women, but we also have to think about gender on a continuum because when we think about our transgendered population, we also see huge issues in terms of addiction and trauma. And so when we look at some of these differences, the exposure, the risk factors, the comorbidity, what are things that happen at the same time, responses, and also our interventions or what we actually do. There are differences. So risk is gendered. Let's think about the world. This is a study on adolescence. The world of boys and girls. In a sample with 115 girls, have they ever been raped or in danger of being raped? 47%. Boys? 6%. The world of boys and girls is different. People continue to think that the issues of gender were taken care of how many years ago. It's alive and well, particularly when we begin to look at trauma. All the different kinds of events in life that can be traumatic, of which there are many, both men and women are at risk of experiencing. However, when we look at interpersonal violence, the violence that happens in the context of relationships, that's where we see the greater risk for females. So when we look at the, over the course of the lifespan, we can begin to see gender differences. So in childhood, boys and girls, children, are both at risk for physical abuse, sexual abuse, and emotional abuse. But when we move into adolescence, the change begins to happen. In a white dominant society, if a boy, a young man, if he's gay, if he's a young boy of color, his greatest risk for harm actually comes from people who dislike him, his peers, often the police. If he's a gang member, his risk of harm comes from that oppositional gang. But compare that to the teenage girl whose greatest risk as a teenager is in her relationships from the person to whom she says, I love you. If we move into adult life, for men, if they're serving in the military, the greatest risk for harm comes from the enemy. If a man's living in the free world, not in our criminal justice system, but in our communities, his greatest risk for harm comes being a, being a victim of crime committed by a stranger. But for the woman in her adult life, if she serves in the military, her greatest risk for harm comes from the men she's serving with, as we're learning more about military sexual assault. And if she's living in our communities, again, her greatest risk comes from her relationships. So when we're working with a man in a substance abuse treatment program, where we see high rates of abuse in the lives of men who are addicts, what you will not see and what is very unusual is to work with a man who is physically and or sexually abused as a child by someone he knew, in his adolescence was physically and or sexually abused in his adolescence by someone he was in a relationship with, and then in his adult life, he was physically and or sexually abused by someone he was in a relationship with. That ongoing or enduring trauma in relationships is unusual in the scenario of a man with an addictive disorder. Very common in the lives of women with addictive disorders. And so when we begin to see some of the statistics on prevalence, You'll see that when we talk about working with women with addictive problems, what we see are these incredibly high rates of abuse. And the group of women 
with the highest rates are the women in our criminal justice system, as um, Georgia was talking about in the Women's Prison Association. The women in our criminal justice system are the most um, vulnerable women in our society. They have the highest rates of addictive disorders, they have the right, highest rates of mental health disorders, and they have incredibly high rates of trauma. And then we put them into environments where when we said, I talked earlier about the trigger, the sight, sound, smell, the things that trigger people, the standard operating practices in the criminal justice system are incredible triggers. A trauma survivor who's shackled, a trauma survivor who's put in isolation, a trauma survivor who's put in a four-point restraint. All of those things begin to aggravate behaviors that a system is trying to control. And so when we look at the process of trauma, you have the traumatic event and you have people's sort of initial reaction to that. And you end up with a person with a sensitized nervous system. We know that there are changes in the brain that we believe become chronic, particularly if there's multiple instances of childhood sexual abuse. There's often a current stressor. A person's in a painful emotional state and we see sort of categories of responses. We have our retreat responses that I would consider our mental health responses, depression, anxiety, the harm to self, and that's where we would see substance abuse disorders, eating disorders, suicide attempts, and then the harm to others, the aggression, the violence, and the rages. And yet we have a system of services that very often doesn't think about trauma. We try to deal with or treat these things in the bottom row without thinking, maybe there's things underneath here that also have to be dealt with. And we also have a gender difference in responses. And this is a generalization, but we have more women doing the left-hand box and the middle box, and more men doing the middle box and the right-hand box. So I'm not saying that women aren't ever aggressive or violent. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying as a generalization. And so we begin to think about, again, how do we determine how our interventions are going to work? And so there's being trauma-informed, which is really about the environment of how the services are provided. Trauma-specific is what we actually do to help people deal with the impact of trauma in their lives. And there are three sort of key things that need to happen, and they're the same three things for staff as they are for the clients. And speaking of staff, I think we also have to realize that many of the people working in the field also have trauma histories themselves. And often, they have not been resolved. And that often becomes one of the barriers to being able to help women move forward is when you have staff that are struggling with this issue in their own lives. But the three primary things that both clients and staff need to know, they need to understand what trauma is and what abuse is. You can't assume that because someone's been abused, they know it's abuse particularly if they've come from families where this has happened generation after generation. Understanding typical responses. I can tell you that sometimes I do, the last 20 years, the majority of my work has been with women and girls in correctional settings. And sometimes something as simple as teaching women about what is post-traumatic stress disorder, that in and of itself for women can be an incredibly healing moment. And they'll say things like, you mean there's a name for this? I've been hiding this for years. I just thought I was crazy. So people need to understand. Women need to know what are typical responses to these kinds of overwhelming life experiences. And the third thing are coping skills. How do you learn to cope? What are the things we can, we can do to help you? In terms of interventions, there aren't that many, really. Um, I've written a number of interventions for uh, trauma-specific work. Lisa Najovitz, we'll speak next, has written also, and Maxine Harris. So we have some materials out there that take women's socialization, women's life experience, women's, the world women live in, and use that lens in order to, to decide how to provide help for women. And we've also developed some trauma-specific materials for men that deal with gender and male socialization. And what does the impact of being raised male have to do with your recovery and your experience of trauma? So recovery. 
You know, years ago, recovery meant what we took out of someone's life. We get the alcohol out of their lives, we get the drugs out of their lives, we get repeated incarceration out of their lives, the trips to the emergency room, hospitalizations. But today when we talk about recovery, we talk about what is added to people's lives. The capacity to experience joy and happiness and serenity. And very often the biggest barrier to a woman really having sustained recovery is the unresolved trauma that peace that she hasn't quite been able to deal with. So in closing, I want to leave you with a challenge. You know, we've been talking a lot here very much about women and sort of in a more individual way. But I'd like to leave you with a challenge that is somewhat more global than that. And this comes out of the New York Times Magazine section a few years ago, and they were talking about moral challenges, and they were talking about women around the world. And they said that the moral challenge of the 19th century was slavery, that the moral challenge of the 20th century was totalitarianism, but the moral challenge of our century is the brutality against women and girls. So if we really, if we really want to talk about prevention and prevention of addictive disorders, then we have to stop, acknowledge, stop not looking at. We have to acknowledge and look at the brutality against women and girls. Thank you. Stephanie, that was fabulous. I want to put a plug in for Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times, who often writes about the very issue you left us thinking about. Um, now let's uh, turn our attention, but before we do that, I want to give a shout out to Cheryl Sharp, who is on the National Council staff and leads all of our trauma initiatives. Um, you'll be hearing more from her in uh, the future. Um, Lisa Nechavitz um, is a professor of psychiatry at Boston University School of Medicine, a lecturer at Harvard Medical School, and an adjunct professor at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. She's a research psychologist for the VA, a clinical associate at McLean Hospital, and she serves as the director um, of treatment innovations. Her major clinical and research interests include substance abuse, trauma, and veterans' mental health. She is an author author of over 170 professional publications and several books. Um, she has served as president of the Society of Addiction Psychology of the APA and is on various advisory boards. Lisa. It is a genuine privilege to be here and to be part of this very important conversation. I've worked in the field of the intersection between trauma and addiction for over 20 years in the interface of research, conducting clinical trials research, developing new psychotherapies in this area, and every day working directly with these clients. And I hope what I can bring to you today is some perspective based on that and based both on community-based care out in frontline programs of all kinds and also in the Veterans Administration healthcare system where I've been for the past decade as well. And first to highlight that trauma as we have heard today is epidemic. The majority of males and females in this country experience one or more traumas in their lifetime. Substance abuse as well is epidemic. Substance use disorders are the second most common psychiatric disorder in the US population, right after depression. And we certainly know the two go hand in hand. In the lives of some of the clients, um, they'll say things like, I drank to get the booze into me, so when he hit me, I wouldn't feel it. Heroin is the only way I know to nurture myself and on and on. And it's very important to listen to the meanings of substance use in the context of trauma. 
Often clients will say they're using substances as a way to feel something. They feel dead inside, numb, detached, no feeling. And using just helps them to feel something. Or the opposite, helping to bring down feelings that are too intense. They feel too much rage, too much sadness, too much fear. And using just helps them calm down a bit. And these two opposites are the opposite extremes of what we often think of as the post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD experience, feeling too little or too much and continually bouncing back and forth between the two. And so substances, as we know, certainly become a way to regulate feelings. For most people who developed a substance use disorder, um, there is a history of trauma and PTSD. And in a quote from William Faulkner, the American writer, who said, the past isn't dead. It isn't even past. When you think of the lives of these clients, even if those events happened many years or decades ago, it still lives on for them, often in a very day-to-day -day way. And there still remains a major public health issue of trying to help bring trauma-informed care, substance abuse, um, state-of-the-art care into the, tr the lives of these clients. I'll mention also that these clients often present very challenging issues for clinicians. Um, they have suffered and they often um, unwittingly, um, often unintentionally create suffering around them. And so providers struggle a lot and need a lot of training in how to deal with clients who are sometimes unmotivated, who have given up. They have been given up on or neglected or abandoned and often give up on themselves and don't take motivation that's needed. The client who's very angry, who gets into power struggles, who's a safety risk, uh, the client who's very um, entitled, not willing to go by the rules, um, entitlement that often stems from serious deprivation. And so as we're thinking about these clients, we also want to think very carefully about the workforce that, um, that they are part of um, the treatment. Um, I'll mention as well um, that there is growing evidence that combining trauma-informed care and trauma-specific services is needed, that neither one alone is enough, um, but it's the combination of the two. There are a variety of resources already available, um, but there often is a gap in translation for clinicians out in the field. I'll mention a couple of resources that I think are some of the most outstanding at this point. Uh, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration has the National Center for Trauma-Informed Care and has been at the vanguard of promoting trauma-informed care. Um, so the SAMHSA website. Um, and you can get to that, www.health.org. Um, the National Center for PTSD in the VA, the VA has been one of the leaders in attending to PTSD and trauma because of the association with military. So www.ptsd.va.gov is another source. Um, another one, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, um, a collaboration between academia and government, um, www.nctsn.org has been very important in trying to address the needs of trauma in children, families, and adolescents. Um, so there are a variety of resources out there. However, there still remain major gaps in terms of clients getting access to good state-of-the-art services. Um, I'll give you an example of an evidence-based practice that I've been involved with um, for a long time now named Seeking Safety, just as one example of what an evidence-based practice in this area looks like. Um, the, uh, it provides at heart a focus on coping skills. Most of these clients have grown up in environments, in families, in communities where they did not learn how to cope successfully, the things that healthy children learn in good families. And so what you'll often see is that the most basic coping skills um, need to be taught. So in Seeking Safety, for example, we focus on this core principle of safety. 
that the goal is to help the client envision what safety would look like, safety in terms of their environment, to the extent that it's possible to shift that, safety in their relationships, learning how to identify who might be safe or unsafe for them, safety in their thinking, um, in their judgments, and so on. And so we have a variety of safe coping skills. They learn skills like asking for help, just how to reach out when they're in distress over the trauma and or the addiction piece. Setting boundaries in relationships, how to say yes to healthy relationships and no to unhealthy ones. Compassion, how to take an understanding view toward their own situation. And sadly, they often don't get um, a compassionate view, sometimes in communities or sometimes even in treatment programs. Often these clients are labeled most of all for the addiction and the trauma piece is much more hidden. But what comes most to light are the legal, social, and other problems connected to addiction with the trauma being more hidden. Taking good care of yourself, how they can take care of their body and their environment, coping with triggers, healing from anger, and on and on. So we teach them a wide variety of skills and the good news is that um, clients and treatment programs are, I think, thirsty for any kinds of help that they can get um, to enable these clients to try to live better lives, learn new skills, learn education about their disorders. Seeking Safety also focuses on case management, meaning linking clients with services. And we certainly know these are clients with multiple needs of all kinds, and they are also some of the most undertreated clients, um, often not linked up to services. And I still remained at times shocked by how clients who have even been in systems of care still may never have had a medication evaluation, and yet can so benefit from psychiatric and other medications who may never have had an HIV test, may never have had any kind of counseling related to domestic violence, despite having lived with it for a long time. So the need to link clients to services is huge. And also the need to link them to good health care. One thing we know is that the impact of trauma is not just emotional, but physical in nature. One of the most famous studies and landmark studies in this area is called the ACE study, which stands for Adverse Childhood Events. And you can find it. There's great information at uh, www.acestudy.org. It was a study of over 10,000 patients in um, the Kaiser Permanente healthcare system in California, basically finding that the more adverse childhood events, meaning traumas or growing up with mentally ill family members or family members who were incarcerated or any other kinds of adverse significant events like that, basically throughout the lifespan are more subject to physical health problems as well as emotional problems of all kinds. And this includes every system of the body as well as healthcare problems like obesity and um, poor nutrition and so on. So um, we certainly know that the mind-body connection and trauma and addiction is huge. Um, there has now been uh, several decades of research looking also at the biological basis of post-traumatic stress disorder and trauma as well as at addiction, and there are very important neuroscience and other biological studies. And basically what you see um, are sometimes permanent changes um, that happen, especially with repeated childhood abuse, a tendency towards greater reactivity throughout the lifespan. Um, sometimes people have described these children as being similar to combat veterans um, in terms of their physiological responses. And so early intervention is key. Um, I'll just 
mention also that um, so far there was a major study, another landmark study in the trauma field, the SAMHSA study, Women, Co-Occurring Disorders and Violence, um, which was really one of the first to try to um, create trauma-informed care as part of a national study. And basically showing that it doesn't necessarily cost more to create trauma-informed care that um, it's a redirection of resources. But programs are struggling, as we've heard today, for solutions that are um, specific in order to provide these kinds of services to uh, clients. And um, I'll close here in the interest of time. Um, but thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you, Lisa, for the focus on populations that are clearly underserved. Our next speaker was acknowledged this morning by the senator from his home state, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Um, Josiah, who I think is called Jody, actually, um, Rich, MD, MPH, is professor of medicine and epidemiology at the Warren Albert Medical School of Brown University. Dr. Rich is a practicing infectious disease specialist at the Miriam Hospital Immunology Center and at the Rhode Island Department of Corrections, where he cares for prisoners prisoners with HIV infections. His research career is focused on the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of HIV AIDS and the comorbid conditions, particularly among incarcerated populations. He's mentored dozens of junior colleagues and approximately three quarters of his over 170 peer-reviewed publications are co-authored by mentees. He's director and co-founder of the Center for Prisoner Health and Human Rights, Dr. Rich. Thank, thank you so much. I, I used the name Jody so that I can invite, get invited to speak at women's forums. <laughs> Some advantage to having a girl's name. I am acutely aware that uh, I'm all that stands between uh, all of us and lunch, so I will keep my remarks as brief as I can. You know, it's, uh, when thinking about addiction in women, you know, as a clinician for over 20 years uh, and, and kind of backed into addiction <clears throat> treating um, people with HIV, uh, so many of my patients had addiction, so many have trauma, uh, I would say that, you know, a, a forum on woman addiction, the story is trauma. Trauma is, is really what this is all about uh, for so many of these women. Um, and we heard a number of things this morning how women are different. There's a telescoping of the, uh, uh, of the course of addiction. They, they tend to go from getting involved to severely involved much quicker than men. The whole issue of women um, uh, and, and children and, and their relationship with their children uh, is very different than for men. And, uh, and, and so having treatment that involves the children, that takes care of the children, is so critical. And we heard, all, we heard about that. Uh, and I would say couples therapy as well. That's something that's not... Um, uh, not very well funded, but certainly uh, can help. The stigma of addiction is really a theme that's been running uh, through all morning and, and really is uh, probably the most uh, critical issue to address uh, and probably most difficult one. Um, but the stigma is worse for women. It's kind of like, you know, if a, if a man is uh, loose and, and, and having sex with a lot of partners, then he's kind of cool. And if a woman, then she's, she's worse. And it's the same with, a, with addiction. If he's using all kinds of drugs and drinking a lot, well, that's okay. <clears throat> if she's drinking, it's a whole different story. So the stigma is even worse for women. The whole issue about perinatal care, uh, and screening. I mean, I think uh, I think screening for addiction should be a, a, a component of all uh, perinatal care, in order to provide more services, not in order to criminalize it. And the whole criminalization of addiction is uh, uh, that's true for men and women. But there's there's a couple issues I wanted to touch on that that haven't uh, been addressed. And we're talking about addiction, and, and there's a lot of similarities with alcohol and different drugs, but really, I think the thing that's brought us all here today is the opioids. Uh, and, and we're talking about it like, well, gee, it's up 400%, it's up here, it's up there, 
it's up in women, it's up in men. And we're talking about it like it just fell from the heavens, like we don't know where it came from. And we do know where it came from. We know exactly where it came from. Um, it came from two things. There was, uh, there's been a pendulum swing of uh, uh, prescribing opioids for addiction, for, for um, uh, treatment of pain. Um, and that pendulum swung um, uh, in one direction uh, in the Civil War. Uh, there was the soldier's disease. There were many people killed <coughs> in that war, uh, but even more came home with soldier's disease. They were addicted to morphine and opium uh, and, and required uh, that treatment when they, when they returned home. And so physicians were prescribing opium and morphine and even uh, cocaine. Um, and then the intemperance movement, the uh, Harrison Act of uh, around 1920, really uh, pushed uh, in, uh, dramatically in the other direction. They uh, uh, incarcerated physicians. They locked up, they, they, they uh, uh, persecuted and, and incarcerated uh, thousands of physicians. And that is apparently a <clears throat> effective way to change behavior among physicians. Um, so, so then it wasn't until uh, you know the 1960s when it, you know, it wasn't that that opioid addiction went away, but physicians were less involved. But it wasn't until the 1960s when the the data was so stark uh, about the use of methadone that this opioid addiction is a deadly disease. It's a deadly disease, and <clears throat> the the use of methadone saved lives. It turned people around, allowed them to get into recovery. So begrudgingly, the government kind of said, okay, well, you can use methadone since it works, but only under very tightly controlled, strictly regulated. Um, and, then, and then the data of 2000 Act uh, came through and, and allowed um, uh, buprenorphine prescribing um, with, with much less um, control. So the, at the same time, there was a recognition in the 70s and 80s that we are doing a lousy job treating pain, particularly cancer pain, end-of-life cancer pain. Oh, no, I can't give them opiates. Oh, my goodness, they might die from that. Well, they're dying anyway. It just was ludicrous. And, and we were under-treating pain at the end of life. It was unconscionable. So there was a big movement, a push to treat cancer pain appropriately. Um, but along on the uh, coattails came treatment of chronic pain. And chronic pain uh, uh, is, a, is an odd thing, and it's not necessarily most effectively treated with opioids. It's most effectively treated with a uh, combination treatment. Um, psychologists, physical therapists, uh, counselors, psychiatrists, and, and, and some medications. But it's much easier just to write and give you a pill. So, so that came along. The, the, there was a push to, to, for physicians to prescribe. And then along came the pharmaceutical industry. And they really are, uh, um, you know, we think about drug dealers as, well, how do they, how do they run their operation? They, they find out who's selling, and they reward the ones who's selling more. And then they, they do that more um, as, a, as a criminal enterprise. And, and there's a lot of similarities to what the pharmaceutical industry did around opioids. Um, and, and pushing it. And really, that's, that's where we're at now. The tonnage of opioids being prescribed. And they, they pushed it. Um, they, in some cases, they were caught and spanked, um, uh, or maybe slapped on the hand. But um, they misinformed physicians. You know, when I was, the, the sort of dogma was, well, Nobody's going to become addicted to opioids if you prescribe appropriately. That was just kind of, everybody heard that and, you know, oh yeah, well, my chief resident told me that, so now I pass it on to my students. But the data wasn't, wasn't there. But the, but the industry pushed it. Okay. Um, the other perspective I wanted to pr provide is about opioid addiction. This is really not... Um, not understood well by the general public um, and by policymakers and by many others. 
Um, but it's a very consistent disease. It's kind of like looking at Down syndrome kids. You know, it doesn't matter if they're black or white or Asian or uh, rich or poor. There's something about them that just you can identify, and they're so similar, so consistent. <clears throat> when I'm talking to somebody who's uh, been addicted to opioids, um, it's like uh, I ask a question, but I know what the answer is going to be. Maybe it's a slight variation, but it's so consistent. So here's a typical story. Uh, a young woman um, had trauma in her life. Um, somebody gave her a pill, maybe a physician, maybe one of her friends. She took it, and she had this feeling, this kind of escape, that, wow, this, this is OK. All this trouble I'm dealing with is, is a little better. Then she took it again, and then she took it again. And after even just a few weeks of taking it regularly, two things developed physiologically. Um, the first is the tolerance. So tolerance means that if you, you, you need a higher dose to get the same effect. So you take a, you're taking one pill a day, and you're getting a certain effect. And then after a few weeks, you don't get that effect with one pill. You need to take two pills, three pills, and so forth. The second, which is really a diabolic uh, property of this uh, disease, is the withdrawal phenomena. Now, if somebody's using opioids regularly, and whether it's heroin or prescription pills, uh, you know, I've heard people distinguish those two. They're the same disease. They hit the same receptor. The behaviors are the same. Uh, in in uh, many ways, the prescriptions are safer because they're a consistent product, and they're made at you know pharmaceutical grade. Um, um, but but they're both you know extremely dangerous. But when somebody there was mentioned earlier today about people are transitioning from prescription pills to, to uh, heroin. And it said, well, heroin, is the price is cheaper. But the way it goes is because your tolerance goes up and up and up, you keep going back to the doctor saying, oh, yeah, my back hurts. Oh, yeah, my, my dentist, my tooth hurts and whatever. And finally, the doctor says, you know, you're just playing around with me. And that's it. You shut off. And then you shut off. And then you go and buy some from somebody. And then you go, <clears throat> you go down that road of trying to get it. Uh, and then finally, you're kind of running out of resources, and somebody says, hey, you know, if you use heroin, it's cheaper, and it, it might even work better. And so then you start using heroin, and you're snorting heroin, this little powder. Unless you're on the West Coast, uh, it comes as a thick, gooey substance, so you have to inject. But then, then you're still not getting the same effect from the, uh, from the uh, snorting the heroin, and somebody says, hey, you know, if you inject that, you're going to get high again. And, uh, and you're going to be, uh, you're going to use less. And they say, oh, that's great. And it's true. They inject it. They get a buzz. And then they, then they feel, you know, like this is good. But then a few weeks later, they're injecting a much higher and higher dose. And then they're injecting, and they can't go back to snorting. They can't go back to pills. Uh, so then they're kind of stuck. Um, now, when um, I, I mentioned the uh, withdrawal phenomena, when some, one patient told me, he says, Doc, when I'm, when I'm going into withdrawal, usually I'll take sleeping pills, I'll take something, and I'll sleep for the first 24 hours. But then I'm awake, and then I can't sleep, and I feel miserable. Imagine the worst flu you ever had. You're aching all over. You're just feeling worse and worse minute by minute, hour by hour. You're, uh, you start getting little goosebumps. You start aching. Your belly starts aching. You start feeling nauseous. You start feeling more nauseous. You start throwing up. Then there's no, nothing left to throw up. You get belly pain. You get, uh, you get the runs. One patient said, Doc, when I, when I get to that point, I, don't, I go in the bathroom, I don't know which end to point towards the toilet because I'm blowing it out both ends. And then you're just sitting there. You're just absolutely miserable. Now, if you're using heroin and you get to that point, after about two or three days, it'll break. You'll start to feel better. And it'll sort of taper. And after a week, you know, you're done. You're, quote, normal. But, but all during that time period, you're going through this miserable hell. And you know that if you just get one little pill, or one little piece of a pill, 
or a little fingernail full of powder and you get that into you, you'll just feel normal. It'll all just melt away. <clears throat> and, and that's what patients say. They say, Doc, I don't even get high anymore. I just want to feel normal. I just want to get off of E. They think that E is the, uh, you know, like a gas tank is empty. You're on E, so I got to get off. So if you're using heroin, heroin's a three time a day drug. And you have to use it three times a day. And if you don't use it, you will go into this most horrible withdrawal. And so people do the most god awful and desperate things to get that, to get off of E, to, to avoid this. And so why are they doing that? And and it's the part of the brain, you know, our brains are hardwired for survival. Survival of the species, we're all interested in sex, and survival of the individual. We breathe, we drink, we eat, and, you know, we think, well, I'm in control of that. I can change my, uh, you know, breathing. I can hold my breath. And that's you, this part of your brain, the, the cerebral cortex, uh, is saying, yes, I'm in control. I'm in charge here. I can decide whether I take a breath or whether I hold my breath. I can decide whether I use drugs or don't use drugs. So you hold your breath. And after about a minute or two, your primitive brain down here says, you know what, you've had your fun, now I'm taking the steering wheel. I'm taking over. I talk about, if I took a glass of water and had cholera toxin in it, and I said, if you drink that water, you are gonna die a miserable death don't drink that water. And then I locked you in a room. At the end of 24 hours, nobody's gonna drink that water. At the end of 48 hours, somebody actually might take a sip. At the end of 72 hours, everybody's gonna take that water. There's a part of your brain that takes over and says, it's liquid, put it into yourself. And it's, you're, this part of your brain's not in control anymore. It's that primitive brain. And that's the part of your brain that's diseased in this, in this opioid addiction. People do what they do because their body, their mind, their primitive mind is telling them, you need to do this to survive. And, that's, and, and if you think about it in that way, it makes sense. So the just say no, <laughs> that isn't, that's not gonna work. Um, um, on the other hand, the medications we have, highly effective. Um, <clears throat> when you get to that point where you need um, opioids, uh, you um, usually run out of uh, resources, depending on who you are and, and your circumstances. And, and pretty much most of the people I work with uh, resort to one or all, th one of three things, or one or all of three things. And it's usually stealing. Uh, getting involved in, in uh, selling your body for m uh, money, sex trade, or getting involved in the drug trade. And, and that's kind of the final common pathway, and it often gets people in, hooked up in the criminal justice system. Um, um, and anywhere along this continuum, from the day you take that first pill to the day that you're going through uh, withdrawal to the, you know, you're strung out, um, you are at risk for overdosing. And, uh, and, and it happens all throughout that continuum. Um, so I, in closing, I guess I would leave us with, with three thoughts. So one is that we, we're having this epidemic of overdose deaths, and that's what we need to focus on immediately, because we can stop those right away. That is the tip of the iceberg, but we need to do things to do whatever we can to stop those deaths. Um, the second is we, we need to treat addiction instead of criminalizing it. Um, and and the, we have the resources, we're spending them on the criminal justice system, but we don't have uh, outcomes data. I mean, we have outcomes data, we don't, we, but we're not thinking about it in outcomes. When somebody, when a judge says, okay, five years in prison, two years in prison, there should be a price tag associated with that, and there also should be a, an expectation of what the outcome is gonna be. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have either of those. So I think I will uh, um, just uh, end at that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists.
Um, I think we can take one or two questions. I know we are way over the time limit, but if you have time to stay, I think our panelists will stay. Questions? So the question um, is, I have to repeat it, I think for the camera, is um, there are just not enough clinicians to do the work that has been described by all the panelists this morning. Lisa. That is um, absolutely spot on. You were correct. And from a public health standpoint, um, there probably never will be enough. Um, one of the ways, and we can take a lot of great education from 12-step movements, which have been grassroots movements that have been freely available since 1935. With Seeking Safety, just to give an example, um, we have piloted it as a peer-led model and gotten positive results from it. And um, because it's been a very safe model, it does seem to lend itself to peer form. So I think the whole, and SAMHSA right now um, puts forth peer um, recovery as one of the key ways that that's going to help transform healthcare. Um, so I would just emphasize that um, peers, also paraprofessionals, people who don't necessarily have licenses or clinical degrees can do therapies like this as well. Stephanie? Yes, and just to also add on to what Lisa said, um, I've had the experience in the last few years also working with women who are incarcerated and using the women who have very long sentences or life sentences and training them to be facilitators of programs in prisons for women. So, because we do need, we need more people. I'd also like to mention technology, which we've not talked about here, but I think we will, someone said, we will never have enough staff. And technology in other industries has really transformed and in many cases extended the reach of staff. I think we've got to think about it for healthcare and behavioral health. Another question? Yes. This is a question about who is utilizing pam, pa, parent and family life education resources. Well, I think most of the women, the, the gender responsive women's treatment programs are using uh, various family programs and certainly some of the prison settings are using family programs. And there's also one family uh, parenting program um, that I think is interesting, was written by Maxine Harris. There are two pieces to it. One is parenting from a distance for women who may be in residential treatment or custodial, and parenting for tr uh, parents who are trauma survivors. So I think that it's very important to consider what's happening with, with kids. Lisa? And just briefly to add to that, uh, just such an important focus, parents, families. Um, the for both PTSD, post-traumatic stress, and substance abuse, the family is one of the biggest predictors due to both genetic and social factors. And so attending to the family and to parenting is absolutely key. So uh, just to highlight that um, that's part of a top quality comprehensive program is attending to it, but too often it's not done. Okay, well thank you all very much and thank you to everyone who spoke this morning. <laughs>